The 1992 season is considered one of the most dramatic, emotional years in NASCAR history. It would be the last for the king of stock car racing, Richard Petty, while also seeing the debut of Jeff Gordon. The first year for the Generation 4 car, and the last for Oldsmobile as a manufacturer in the series. Daryl Earnhardt was a defending champion, and GM had a streak of 16 straight manufacturer's championships shared between Chevrolet and Buick. The season-long championship battle would come down to the final race where six drivers mathematically had a chance to win the title. The preseason championship favorite, number one, has to be Darrell Earnhardt, who was attempting to win his sixth championship and third in a row, something only one other driver at the time had accomplished. Kel Yarbrough in 1976, 77, and 78. Everyone believed his strongest competition would come from Davey Allison. Larry McReynolds joined Robert Yates Racing in 1991 as Allison's crew chief. Their first year together produced five wins and a third place finish in points. And expectations were high entering the 1992 season. The question mark drivers, 1989 champion Rusty Wallace failed to finish in the top five for points during the 1990 and 91 seasons. The lack of success following 1989 was attributed to issues within the Blue Max Racing Team and contract disputes with owner Raymond Beadle. Wallace would join Penske Racing in 1991, and many thought his second season with the team would give Roger Penske his first NASCAR Cup championship. Mark Martin would also be a preseason favorite. In 1990, Martin pushed the championship to the final race, Dale Earnhardt edging him out by 26 points in the end. A controversial penalty early in the season that cost Martin 46 points is why some consider Martin the 1990 champion. 1991 would be a disappointment for the number 16 as they won only one race and finished six in points. Most expected Martin and his Roush team to rebound in 1992 and finally secure the championship. There were no bigger question marks than those around Bill Elliott. Having departed Melling Racing, who had won 34 races in the 1988 championship, Elliott would join Junior Johnson team, placing Jeff Bodine in the iconic number 11 car. Never mind the beer wars as he went from Coors Light to Budweiser sponsorship, the number 11 car had won six championships with Junior Johnson, last coming in 1985. Elliott would be paired with legendary crew chief Tim Brewer. Now for the outside looking in drivers, Ricky Rudd, which is strange to say he would be on the outside looking in considering he finished second points for 1981. He won only one race during the year, some say two, if you remove the black flag at the end of the Sonoma race that dropped him from first to second. His consistency had many thinking he was a serious contender. Next would have to be Darrell Waltrip, the three-time champion in the second year driving for his own team. He won two races in 1981. Maybe old Jaws had a bit more left in the tank, but many felt these were the twilight years of a Hall of Fame career. Certainly a long shot to win the championship, but you couldn't rule him out. And last of the outside looking in drivers, one of my all-time favorites, Harry Gant. If Darrell Waltrip was considered a long shot, this would be almost an impossibility for a driver in his 50s to win the championship. However, in 1991, Handsome Harry would win five races, four in a row during the latter part of the season, which carried him to a fourth-place finish in points. If the Bandit could continue that success, the impossibility might become a reality. You may have noticed I did not mention Alan Kowicki. He would have fallen into the no chance category. I mean, I don't think anyone actually believed he was a contender for the championship. If they tell you that today, I say they are doing some revisionist history. Besides, if a driver owner was going to win the championship, surely it was going to be Darrell Walter. Kowicki only finished inside the top 10 for points one time prior to 1992. And that was in 1990 where he finished eighth. So let's get this season started with the Bush Clash held for the 1991 pole winners and one wild card made by 15 drivers. Jeff O'Donnell. In his first outing in the Bud Moore number 15 car, won the race. And for the Daytona 500 qualifying, Junior Johnson put his two cars on the front row with Sterling Marlin in the number 22 on the pole and Bill Elliott in second. The Gatorade 125 qualifiers, Bill Earnhardt would win the first race while Bill Elliott won the second. With a gentleman representing the kingdom of Random in North Carolina, kingdom. please start his engine. Okay, we'll go with that. This would be the theme all year long. It was an appreciation tour for Richard Petty. He said, fire it up, King, come on. That is the greatest sound in the world. Now we gotta get King to give the command to start your engines. Okay, guys, let's go. Okay, guys, let's go. Drag them up. 
not as smooth as we practiced, but uh, hey, here we go. Daytona 500 on the way. Three weeks removed from leaving Washington to a victory in the Super Bowl, Joe Gibbs made his debut as a car owner. has taken the lead into turn one and his teammate Bill Elliott right on his bumper. Sterling Marlin, Bill Elliott controlled the front row and would lead 58 with the first 91 laps. First caution flew on lap 84 for a brief rain shower. The race is restarted on lap 90. Just a couple of laps later, we have Marlin, Elliott, and Ernie Irvin going three wide. And they're about to make it three wide off the banking. Ernie Irvin down on the inside of number four. Storms into the lead in the back straightaway. Ernie Irvin out of Modesto, Ooh. California. Hits. He's into Elliott. They're sliding, trying to correct. Pick them up. Into the wall goes Sterling Marlin. And the leaders are all in trouble here. Richard Petty's car getting hit. A serious crash in the back straightaway. Here we are coming off the second turn. We've got three cars side by side. This is the big no-no right here. Right now, when you look at these cars, you've got a car sitting out here on the outside. You've got the car of Bill Elliott. You've got the four car of Ernie Irvin here. The guy in the middle is the one that's in trouble. They'll tell you, these outside car, the outside, the inside, okay, the guy in the middle is gonna pay the price. As they, <laughs> I as think they, they all kind of paid the, the price track, on this one. We'll see them just start coming together. The four cars moving up. A lot of that has got to do with aerodynamics. It looked like they moved over, but the guy in the middle doesn't have any downforce, and he's along for the ride. What happened out there then? I don't know. Next thing I knew, I turned sideways, and that was it. But the car was running very good, and it doesn't look all that bad at the front, not compared to Mark Martin's. How bad is it? It's bad. It crushed all the left front end on it, and it'll take a while to fix it. Yeah, pretty disappointing start to the season. <laughs> what caused it? I don't know. You know, next thing I knew, I was turned left into uh, the four car. That's all I know. There you have it, straight from the horse's mouth. The big one eliminated 14 cars from the event. Davey Allison slipped by unscathed and would lead 95 of the final 100 laps. He's able to close it up right now. Back to the stripe, white flag, and one lap to go to decide the Daytona 500. Davey Allison in front and Morgan Shepard in second. Shepard stays right there. He's closed it all the way down. Robert Yates looks on. Davey Allison's mentor. Okay, he's back. He's backed off a little again to see how much momentum he can get. He tried it the last time around. He was able to pull right back up on his bumper. Timing is everything now, Neil. That gap right there should pay off at the end of the back straightaway if he's got the momentum to do it. Around Michael Waltrip's car. Down for the finish. Going into turn three. Mike? Glenn Wood, can he do it? I, I don't think so. He's he pretty strong. It's just up to Morgan how he gets in the turn with him. Here, Here they comes come. Morgan down to the line. Davy Allison first. Morgan Shepard gets it all back there. Has he got anything left? Coming to the stripe. Morgan comes to the inside, and Davy Allison is going to win the Daytona 500. The Alabama gang has done it again. The son of a great champion at this track, Bobby Allison. Davy Allison victorious in the 34th annual Daytona 500. 14th career win for Davey Allison. Comes in the one race that means the most. So Davey Allison wins the Daytona 500. Earlier I said the championship came down to six drivers going into the final race. However, I marked the big three for the 1992 season, being Allison, Elliott, and Kowicki, and will highlight their results in each race. I created the times rank number one. That is strictly a counter for the driver who finished first among the three. It's not about how many points they receive for a race, but strictly where they finished in comparison to each other when the checker flag fell. So, race number one goes to Davey Allison. Easy enough, considering he just won the Daytona 500. Kowicki comes in second with a respectable fourth place finish after starting 41st. And Bill Elliott relegated to third, having finished 27th. Allison will take his 10-point lead into race number two at Rockingham. Heading in the race, pole sitter Kyle Petty, the two-time defending race winner, was attempting to not only make it three in a row, but collect the Unical 76 Challenge bonus money, which had rolled over for 24 races. And yes, there's more pressure than ever on these teams from Detroit auto manufacturers to win on the one circuit where U.S. car makes still dominate. Ford has posted a $50,000 bonus if a Thunderbird wins today's or any other of the Winston Cup races. Now, that's twice as much as the racetrack will pay today's winner. 
Early in the season, you could sense Ford was serious about breaking that manufacturer's championship drought that had lasted since 1969. Not a good day for Alan Kowicki, as he would find trouble on lap 52. Yeah, that's what he did. Earnhardt told his own on the outside, and he come on across anyway. You know, all day yesterday we saw people try to climb that wall, and it's impossible to do when it's starting again today. It really tears some equipment up in that off turn two over there. So Kowicki is in the garage area trying to make repairs for the Hooters Thunderbird, and Dale Jarrett's state batteries car is going to the garage as well. Here we go. We got it. There's Earnhardt on the outside, Kowicki on the inside. See him come across. And he moves He's over. He's in his lane there now. Yep, he thought he'd cleared Boom. him. Nowhere to go on the outside. Just moved over. And now you're going to see a pretty good shot off of that wall. Kyle Petty's bid to go three in a row would come to an end in the last 100 miles as a camshaft issue dropped him out of the race. Blew up. Goodbye, Greenback. Yep. Bill Elliott recovered nicely from his Daytona crash and would lead the final 213 laps, winning by 12.75 seconds, nearly half a lap. And here comes Bill Elliott, poised to win his first race for Junior Johnson in the Budweiser Ford, takes home the laurels and the winner's share of the Goodwrench 500. What a car, what a drive. I'll tell you what, Tim Brewer, Junior Johnson, all the guys back in the shop did a heck of a job putting this piece together. We never touched it all day long. I told Tim yesterday afternoon, I said, I've never had a car that drove this good here. And I said, unless that totally goes to pot, I said, it's good. And I said, we'll just have to wait and see. So Elliott takes a win and ranked number one in the big three championship battle. Davey Allison followed up his Daytona victory with a second place finish while extending his points lead over Morgan Shepard. Elliott and Allison led a combined 450 of 492 laps. Kawiki, after being involved in a crash early in the race, would finish 31st. Richmond in race number three. Remember that Unical 76 challenge money I spoke of last race? Well, it's about to be cashed in after 25 rollovers. Pole sitter Bill Elliott nearly stunk up the show. I say nearly because he led 348 to 400 laps but a late charge by Alan Kowicki took a little stink. If that makes any sense, he took a little stink off the stunk. And again, Elliott on the outside draws away. Here comes Kowicki back in the main straightaway. Made it up that time. One leg in right now. One lap to go. This is for everything. It's Bill Elliott from Dawsonville, Georgia on the outside. Wisconsin's Alan Kowicki on the inside. Side by side down the back straightaway. Even as they go to turn three. Kowicki there. Elliott pulls a little ahead on the outside. Driving for the finish. Here comes Kowicki up on the bottom of the racetrack. Kowicki going for all of it. They touch and across the line. It's Elliott. Bill Elliott has done it by about a foot to a foot and a half. Incredible finish. Elliott claimed the Unical 76 challenge of $197,600, second highest total awarded in the history of the program. This was his second and final short track win of his career. Well, they say you weren't aggressive enough to win a lot of short track races, but I'm looking at this tire mark in the door. Tell us about the last lap. Well, I'll tell you, I knew Kowicki was coming, and I knew he was going to give it everything he had, and I knew I had to get down and get in the throttle coming out of turn four, or he was going to beat me, and he just about did it. He just ran out of real estate, and I ran out of real estate, and we got together, but I was still able to beat him back. I wasn't going to about to back off. I didn't care what I did. Now, you were so, so Elliott wins his second race, two in a row, securing him the number one rank among the big three. Kowicki came in second, and Allison would finish fourth, extending his points lead, but now we see Elliott breaking into the top five, sitting third in points. Atlanta, race number four. And we've already got issues for Davey Allison just going into the race. We saw Davey Allison back in the 13th row, Daytona 500 winner. Man who's been struggling with motors this weekend as well. He's been having trouble with the handling. For some reason or another, Atlanta's just not suiting him and probably related to the radial tires that Benny talked about a while ago. And they talked about they've changed five engines. That's bullshit. They have changed five engines here this, this weekend. Apparently they're finding metal, metal particles in the oil, and that's something you really have to worry about. Despite the pre-race issues, Allison appeared to have the race-winning car, with Alan Kowicki holding steady in the top five, and Bill Elliott mired back around 15. However, this would be one of those races where it seems 
everything was lining up for Bill Elliott. Those type of races that you need to win a championship. It was still early in the season, but when you don't have the best car, not even a top 10 car, yet you still find a way to win through luck or grit, you gotta be thinking, everything is going my way this year. Late in the race, leader Allison and all the front running cars pit under green for what would be their final scheduled stop of the day. Every car on the lead lap had pitted for tires and fuel, except for Bill Elliott, whose Budweiser Ford had been enjoying good fuel mileage. Suddenly, Mike Wallace spun in turn two, bringing out a caution with 40 laps to go. Elliott was on a lap by himself. Takes a quick spin, the caution flag is out. Wallace, we're gonna have a caution. And Bill Elliott is the leader. I think they gotta race Elliott back to the line. They may be a lap down to Elliott. Unbelievable situation now. Boy, that's the type of thing that you never can count on. Our, our board, our NASCAR monitor says that Bill Elliott, in fact, did not make a pit stop and has these cars a lap down. This caution. Tim Brewer and Junior Johnson looked at each other and literally just started smiling. Elliott is coming in now to get what should be his final pit stop underway, and it will be under the luxury of caution. And he can he will be the only car on the pit road because only the cars on the lead lap can pit now, and he's the only car on the lead lap. It's, well, nice, <laughs> it's nice to be good. It's also real nice to be lucky. You can talk you about up? luck. Now, this is one of the darndest things I've seen. I mean... He really, really gained an advantage here. Theoretically, unless something happens, they can't catch him, Bob. Boy, what a reversal. Let's see if we can get a word with Tim Brewer. Tim, unbelievable. The luck of the draw, the caution comes out, and lo and behold, you're the only car on pit road. Well, you know, you know, Jack, we learned this together back in 81. <laughs> you know, you'd rather be lucky than good any day, but uh, no, nah, that's... That's characteristic of a Winston Cup racing. You know, you, you go on and do what you're supposed to be doing, do what you got to do to your car, and just keep working. I mean, you know, you ain't never out till they drop that checkered flag up there, and we sure ain't out of this one yet. I think that says it all, guys. Another so Elliot, hidden under the caution, was able to keep the lead, return to the track in the middle of the pack, but still scored as a leader. On the restart, second place Gant led the pack with third place Allison right behind, but both were nearly a full out behind leader Bill Elliott, who would go on to cruise to an 18-second win in his third straight victory. If I was Bill, I think I would back off just a little bit more because there's a big pack of cars right direct in front of him. White flag, mile and a half to go, the 500 miles for Bill Elliott. As with a strong lead, he goes into the first and second turn and is on his way to making it three in a row. Gant runs alone in second place as he flashes across the line. But Bill is definitely awesome today. He's won three of four races if he can only make it to the checkered flag. He comes out the number four turn, Paul. He can slide the rest of the way. And here comes Bill Elliott. Three in a row as Elliott wins on his hometown track here at Atlanta. You've won races as a driver, as a car owner, in a lot of different ways, and this is about as nice a way to win one, I guess, as you can find. Well, I think this is the easiest one we've ever won. We just won it with luck, and that's, you know, if you win it with luck, that's easy for you. If you have to fight for it, it's hard. And he is the winner of today's race. <laughs> Phil, unbelievable. That's the only thing you can say. Thank you, me that right. <laughs> <laughs> we won more than flip all day long. The crew did it, I'll tell you. I can't... Well, now, wait a minute. You want to give it back? No. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what. I've lost races here before, but I ain't never won one like that before in my whole life. Elliot wins the race and takes the number one rank for the third time. Allison, who started 25th and led most of the race, would have to settle for fourth, while Kawiki finished seventh. Elliot, now tied with Harry Gant for second points, only 58 behind Allison. Darlington, the race number five. The early season stories besides Bill Elliott and Davey Allison was defending champion Daryl Earnhardt and GM. The Daytona 500 winner, Davey Allison, is on top. Bill Elliott, who has won the last three races, and Harry Gant are tied for second position. In the second five, notice there in eighth position, the current Winston Cup reigning champion, Dale Earnhardt. And believe it or not, he has not led a single lap in the first four races of the 92 season. 
the other big story in Winston Cup racing is the four domination. They've won all four events this year. They won the last four last year. Ned and Benny have more on that. You're right, Bob. Everywhere we go, the fans want to know what's NASCAR going to do about the Fords. They've won eight in a row. Ned, last year, the GM cars won nine in a row to start the season in 1991. But I think the fans' mindset is Ford versus Chevrolet. Last year, Chevrolet won a couple, then Pontiac won a race. Chevrolet won a couple more, Pontiac won another one. Chevrolet won a couple more, then an Oldsmobile. But in the Ford team's mindset, that's General Motors versus Ford. They say, hey, GM won nine in a row. What are you screaming about? We won eight in a row. Well, you know, Benny, one thing that has helped the Fords win those eight in a row is Bill Elliott and the emergence with he and Junior Johnson and the Budweiser team this year. Don't think even Junior and Bill expected them to do as well as they have winning the last three races. Allison would control the first half of the race, leading early and often, while feeling pretty good about the state of Robert Yates racing. You remember at Atlanta that Davey Allison changed the engine in his car like three times on race morning. We asked him, does this still increase your chances of winning? Robert Yates Racing, that's all I can say. Those guys in the engine room at our shop do a great job. The engine that we ran at Atlanta was actually one that we tested 265 laps at North Wilkesboro three days before that. So I think that kind of says a lot for our guys and to have a motor that had that much time on it. They didn't even have time to change the valve springs. I mean, they just took it out of the car that we had tested, put it in the car that we were racing, and away we went. Davey Allison with the lead again. Darrell Waltrip, who ran Will all day, brought out the second caution after getting Bodine. Involving Darrell Waltrip. He's backed his Western Auto Chevy into the wall back in the race. Here is a replay. Walter going into turn one. Contact with Jeff, it looked like. Jeff Bodine was trying to get under him. Apparently, Daryl didn't see him, and Daryl backs into the wall hard. Well, Darrell Waltrip has climbed out of what's left of the Western Auto Chevrolet in DW. You had a pretty good run going. What happened up there? <clears throat> you know, I'd like to tell you what really happened up there. LSDW, but, uh, come on, I'm give it to us. I'm trying not to, but there was a little turd driving number 15 <laughs> that run over me. There you go. What happened? Can you get it fixed, D.W.? No, no. That knocked us out. You know, I moved out of the way for everybody. I moved up for him. I guess it wasn't enough. As Dale Jarrett wore a Dallas Cowboy-themed helmet for the race. As you recall from earlier, Joe Gibbs debuted as an owner of the 18 car for the 1992 season. Gibbs had coached for Cowboys rival Washington Redskins. Had what? Hold on, my producer's telling me something. You can't say that anymore? Commanders? What the hell is that? Speaking of a new team, take a look at the helmet he's wearing here, the star on the side. That is the Dallas Cowboys. Now, one of their As we reached the second half of the race, it was shaken down to battle between Harry Gant and Bill Elliott, with the last lead change coming on lap 323, when leader Gant opted to pit for new tires in an attempt to run down Elliott during the final 45 laps. And Harry Gant, as you said, gentlemen, will take the opportunity to go ahead and come on pit road to get the tires on the car. But Harry Gant's got a problem right now. There's a lot of traffic. Well, he's going to dispose uh, of that yeah, traffic. Yeah, he'll dispose of that traffic in a hurry. Just went around. Alan Kowicki, running third at the time, would have an engine let go just a few laps away from the finish. Had been in the top ten and, in fact, in the top five most of the day, but his end, his race ends about eight laps short. Here's the white flag for Bill Elliott. One more lap to go. How about since, since the North Wilkesboro run? Dale Earnhardt won, and then Ford did win the race at Charlotte. Mm -hmm. Last lap for Elliott. Don't imagine that Budweiser crew. There's a race for position. Yeah, the 26 car of uh, Brett Bodine has... No, I know it was for position. Bodine is the last no, lap. You're right, yeah. Brett is in fifth. That's what I did. Here comes Elliott off the corner. Checkered flag is waiting. There it is. Elliott wins his fourth consecutive win. So Elliott held off Gantt for his fourth consecutive victory, tying the modern air record for most successive wins. Interesting that Gantt, who finished second, completed the feat in 1991, and who finished third? Mark Martin, who would also win four in a row during the 1993 season. Were they telling you the interval with Harry Gantt? I mean, he was coming in a hurry, but you had quite, a, quite an advantage. Well, you know, we knew he'd had, he had a long way to go, and I was doing everything I could every day to save a car. I mean, it was just a, a perfect day. I mean, I don't know 
we just keep doing everything right. I don't know what to say. I mean, they're making it easy for me. That's, I'm just riding. Elliott takes rank number one for the fourth time among the big three, with Allison again leading the most laps, but finishing fourth, while Kawicki finished 18th after the engine issue. Elliott would also take sole possession of second place in points, just 48 behind Allison. At this point, a casual fan may be thinking, good grief, there have only been five races, and Elliott has won four of those races, and he's still not leading the points. Well, the one Elliott didn't win, he finished 27th. Allison won that race, and since then, he'd finished no worse than fourth. Bristol in race number six. What struck me as strange, this was the last asphalt race at Bristol International Raceway. After the race ended, the blacktop would be torn up and a new concrete surface laid down. Why is that strange? They had just repaid Bristol with new asphalt. They were going to turn around and tear it up and put concrete down. Welcome to Bristol, the world's fastest half mile racetrack, and it's even faster this year because of the new pavement. Two and a half miles an hour over last year's track record. That's what Alan Kowicki qualified at for today's race. Time this year, there's calls for smiles in the GM camp. Just take a look at row two, for example. Dale Jarrett, his best qualifying effort of the year in the Interstate Battery Chevrolet. Yes, he has not won, but remember, car owner Joe Gibbs was 0-5 his first five games of the Redskins, and we all know what's happened since. He has turned it around. Maybe Jarrett can hear in start number six. Alan Kowicki won the pole and would lead the majority of the first 200 laps. The King's Appreciation Tour runs into a bit of an issue on lap 16. Bristol International Raceway has begun to take its toll already. You see As he exits turn two, we'll see the car all of a sudden it just turns right, like he did in Dalton last week. See, the car just all of a sudden, the right front goes down and into the wall. Along comes Richard with nowhere to go. Not a good start for Billy Elliott as he opts to pit. They believe they have missed the setup. Because they didn't get any practice at all yesterday with the inclement weather and the lengthy Bush Grand National Race. Well, Elliott has complained in the first few laps of the car being so loose he could hardly drive it. And it doesn't get much better for Billy Elliott after the race restarts. Well, Bill Elliott is spun coming off the second corner. Morgan Shepard almost got into it. Wow, the Elliott Express uh, is near derailment here as he has already made a pit stop and now spins coming off to turn number two, bringing out our second caution of the day. This graphic will just knock your socks off. Look at this. Earnhardt, after five races in 1991, had led 225. This year, none. Rudd had led 223. This year, none. Irvin, Martin, and Jeff Bodine are also drivers that had led laps at this time last year, but have not led a lap in 1992. Welcome back to Bristol International Raceway. Under caution once again for a spin. As Alan Wicky just makes a push on and off pit road for Buell Earnhardt, who had just taken the lead moments ago to lead his first lap in 1992, getting service from the Goodrich Crew. A cut tire would send Earnhardt to pit road where he picked up a speeding penalty. How would you like to be that NASCAR official? Hey, we need you to hold the three. You need to stand directly in front of the car. You mean directly in front? How about a little off to the side? They have marked the puncture wound here in the right rear tire. A small little opening. The tire was going down. Earnhardt had to change right side tires. He was also held 15 seconds in the pits. I don't know about you, but does this seem like 15 seconds? Yeah, okay, yeah, that's, that's good enough. I'm getting out of the way. Go, go. Just, yeah, just go. Davey Allison appeared to be a threat midway through the race as he held the lead for 49 laps. Right there with him, Brent Bodine is third, and in fourth place is the car number seven of Alan Kowicki. And Elliott's day went from bad to worse. And we have a crash. Kyle Petty, Jeff Bodine, Bill Kevin Elliott, Grave, and Bill Elliott all involved. That came right at the halfway point, but the Gillette halfway challenge was concluded, and Daryl Walker was leading at the half that point. Kick Ricky Rudd trying to get his lap back, but Bill Elliott pulled up in front of him. Rudd was up beside of Darrell Walker, but Bill didn't know he was back there and caused Ricky to not get his lap back. And things begin to go just a bit sideways for Davey Allison on pit road. During the caution, the 28 car was penalized a lap. Let's go to Jerry Punch. Well, he had come back in. Remember, I told you he the car slid through the pits. He slid through some brake fluid that had leaked out when they were trying to work on the pit above him. 
on the car number six. That was a Mark Martin. And Larry McReynolds has talked to NASCAR. He has tried to plead his case. He said, look, guys, we came back in to change left side tires. The six car was sitting half in and half out. We couldn't get in our box, so we went ahead and changed tires anyway. Larry McReynolds absolutely irate, saying, I know what the rules are. I know you get penalized. <laughs> Larry for is giving it that official. Here. The Robestus car All he does is, is like, hey, the get Bible back over the wall. Was behind us. He was waving up toward NASCAR, saying, we need to be understanding about this. But the penalty stands, and now Davey Allison is one lap down. And to top it off, after the restart, something lets go into the hood of Allison's 28 car, sending him into the wall. The hit would separate cartilage around his rib cage and not two vertebrae out of place. And Davey Allison just blew going into turn three, took and Ernie Irvin and Darrell Walker. Darrell might have escaped maybe with not too much damage to his Chevrolet. Boy, that was pretty heavy damage to Darrell's car. You ever see the 17 car coming through? The four car going around with some damage to the left rear. Kenny Schrader spent it. Yeah, I don't think he hit anything. Jerry, I've caught up with Larry McReynolds, and Davey hit the wall pretty hard, Larry, uh, taking him to the infield care center, I understand. Yeah, he, he did walk to the ambulance, John, but he's complaining about his ribs hurting him, and, you know, really couldn't talk to him enough to, to, to see what happened. We may have lost an engine. We may have just got in a wreck. You know, I think the bottom line behind this is if we didn't blow an engine, we had no business back there where we was. You know, NASCAR had no right to place us back there. They told us we could talk about it after the race, but a lot of good that does now. It's Larry McReynolds crew chief on Davey Allison's points leading team. So the 28 team is scrambling to get the car back on the track to get points. Davey Allison's not going to be able to drive it, but now we run into the politics of NASCAR relief drivers. Well, they've been looking around, you know, they thought about Davey mentioned Harry Gant, but you know, the General Motors Ford situation, I don't think that would really work that well. They uh, were looking for a Ford driver. They have been looking for Sterling Marlin, and just a minute ago they found him. Sterling is willing to help out, but you got to make sure uh, that it's okay with Junior Johnson because if Sterling helps Davey, Davey would probably maintain that point lead. And the fellow who's running second in the points right now is Bill Elliott, of course, who, who drives for Sterling's boss, Junior Johnson. So they're going to clear with Junior before he gets in the car and goes back out. Well, there's a lot to think about, isn't there, when you're <laughs> yeah. looking for a release? There is. <laughs> there is a lot. It used to be a real simple. And Jerry, let's get a call to Junior Johnson, who's allowed Sterling Marlin to replace Davey Allison in that 28 car. You really have to, Bob. You know, Junior really showing a lot of sportsmanship, even though allowing his own driver, Sterling Marlin, to get in Davey Allison's car could actually hurt him in the long run because Bill Elliott's car is somewhat crippled, not running around at full speed. And by season's end, those points could cost them possibly a championship. So a good move, a very sportsmanlike move for the legendary Junior Johnson. There is Sterling Marlin driving the Haviland Ford number 28. Davey Allison crashed this car. As mentioned before the race, it appeared Joe Gibbs and his number 18 car driven by Dale Jarrett may be headed for victory in just their sixth race. However, Kowicki used lap traffic to maneuver around Jarrett with 27 laps to go. We get home the winner's circle. A lot is at stake, and John Kernan is with our Western Auto Mechanic of the race. We're, we're with Jimmy Maycar, who is busy watching Dale Jarrett, watching the progress. And now he just saw that Alan Kowicki did get by, but Jimmy, you're named the mechanic, uh, mechanic of the race, even though you're now in second. Do you think Dale? Two, two laps to go. It appears as if Alan Kowicki will win his fourth Winston Cup race here this afternoon. Here comes the white flag. One more lap to go for Allen. Greenfield, Wisconsin driver, who first win came in his 85th start at Phoenix. He was the 1986 Winston Cup Rookie of the Year. He's in turn number three, now in turn number four. The Ford win streak continues. Bill Elliott's streak is broken. Alan Kowicki wins the Food City 500. I tell you, Dale gave him everything he wanted, but Alan pulled his tires there a little bit and then made his move, didn't he? Yeah, you know, Alan did a good job, and all the guys in the crew done a great job. You know, the Hooters Ford ran good all day long. We knew this was going to be a good race for us, and we also know this is going to be a good year for us. This right here proves it, you know. After climbing out of the car and a big uh, drink of cold Gatorade, Alan, congratulations on a tremendous effort today. Yeah, thanks. It was a great run for us. That's probably the, the strongest I've ever been for a whole race, and the car worked great right from the drop of the green flag. Um, it just as good as it didn't qualify, and really, we didn't change very much, and uh, we just had a good run there. I almost, almost messed it up for myself there. We just went over the front line a little bit on the last pit stop and backed up, and 
Dale Jarrett gave me a good hard run at the end there. I had to work pretty hard to get him, but we pulled off a pretty good move in traffic to get it. And so not a great day for two of the big three, but Kawiki takes his first win of the season and first ranked number one among the big three. Elliott would finish 20th and Allison finished 28th. Allison's point lead shrunk to 29 ahead of Elliott and Kawiki makes his first appearance in the top five for points at fifth. North Wilkesboro, and race number seven. It was Junior Johnson Appreciation Day. Junior, of course, lives just down the road from here. And certainly a legend in this area, Bob. On the racetrack, you can see Junior has gotten the top the 1903 Budweiser beer wagon pulled by beautiful Clydesdale horses as he takes a trip around this racetrack and the fans salute him. Well, this is not the first time that he has uh, followed animals, uh, certainly in this part of the country, Bob. He grew up on a farm near here, and uh, most of the time it was mules, not these fancy <laughs> horses like the Clydesdales. And based on trends at the track, GM was feeling pretty confident they could break that Ford winning streak. Bob, all year we've talked about the Ford Chevrolet battle, and every Sunday afternoon the Fords have been winning that battle, but the General Motors products might have their best shot here this afternoon at North Wilkesboro. Only one Ford has won on this 5 8 mile track since 1980, and that was Mark Martin in 1990. And one of the major stories going into the race, how would Debbie Allison rebound after suffering several injuries during the previous race? Well, the diagnosis on Davey Allison was quite simple. He separated a rib from the cartilage here in the front near the sternum or breastbone. He tried to get in the car here on Friday to practice and qualify. He ran four laps and the pain was excruciating and he could not get in. Now, what they have done is gone to an orthopedic surgeon locally and get a transcutaneous nerve stimulator. What was that again? A transcutaneous nerve stimulator. Well, what, what is that? Basically, it's a battery-operated electrical device attached to his back trying to keep the pain minimal. He ran 100 laps yesterday. It was uncomfortable, but not too bad. So he may try to run today. But if he can't, the driver who qualified his car seventh is standing by in the pits behind me. That is gentleman Jimmy Hensley. So we got Alan Kowicki on pole for the second straight race. And he would lead the majority of the first 200 laps. Again, the King's Appreciation Tour runs into issues before lap 20. And a crash in turn number four. Looks like that uh, Dale Jarrett involved and Richard Petty. Some heavy damage to Richard in the front of his car. That is unbelievable. Last week, the King's race was cut short when he collided with Sterling Marlin, who had spun an opportunity to. Here it is again. Well, it looked like Dale Jarrett was spinning coming off the turn up there. He was on the high side of the racetrack. He spins all the way around down the inside, and Richard just... Uh, and Richard ran in the back of the Daryl Walter automobile. Daryl is who Richard Petty had, not Dale Jarrett. And on lap 129, looked like this may be another rough day for Davy Allison. Lap number 130, and this is what happened in turn number two as Petty and Allison were battling for a position. Once again, Kyle Petty trying to get position on Davy Allison. They touch. Around goes Davy, and Dick Trickle gets hit behind by Jeff Bodine. He spins. On lap 223, get some action on the track with a wreck, followed by a brief red flag for rain and the second usage of the word turd. Keeping count, that's seven races and two usage of the word turd. Earnhardt has taken third while we give you another field summary. Oh, oh, and Michael is into the wall in a whole big pileup in the third turn, blocking the track. This is our sixth caution, and we'll look at this again. Here we see Harry Gant trying to get on the inside of Michael. Michael does not realize he's there. He comes down, Harry touches him in the left rear, and around he goes. Then Rusty Wallace runs in the back of Harry. He spins, and uh, everybody hit everybody. <laughs> Boy, isn't <laughs> racing fun? <laughs> we see all those yellow tarpaulins on the, down on pit road. <laughs> I That's think Benny's colorblind. Blue tarpaulins. What did I say? Yellow. Did I say yellow? Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't think it's going to last very long, the rain. And the now is over. What happened? Well, I don't, you know, I thought when you got old, you're supposed to get patient. And uh, there's an old guy driving a green car. I'm not going to call him a turd because he isn't. He's a good guy. But uh, <laughs> I don't know what he is right now. He's just really upset because he ran over me. A long time ago, I started to mention, and I was interrupted by a caution period, that we congratulate this guy sitting next to me on my left because Benny Parsons uh, took a bride last night. Oh, that may explain why he's having trouble with his colors today. Had a bit of a late night, if you know what I mean. 
Just to tell you what kind of a guy he is, that they were originally planning the wedding, uh, what, in Lake Tahoe or someplace yeah, uh, in early June, but because uh, uh, all of us were here and because so much of Benny's family is still living here in this area, they decided to have it last night. We appreciate being able to share it with you. Well, thank you. Despite the early spin, the injuries, the relief driver standing by, Allison has stayed in the car and worked his way up to second behind leader Rusty Wallace. A caution for Kyle Petty sends everyone to pit road. Everybody else coming down pit road right now. More pit stops as Jerry Punch is now positioned in Rusty's pit. Jerry. And we'll see if Andy Dickerson, Bill Wilburn, and the rest of this public venue and grand crew can duplicate their efforts of just one caution to go. And they will try to service him and get him back out as quickly as possible. The right front tire rolls away. The two on the top, 15 on the bottom. As you're watching Jeff Bodine's Motorcraft crew going to work the Budmore team. Now, left side tires going on to the Pontiac of Rusty Wallace. Left side tires likewise on left side. And Davey Allison's left side tires. The Havlin Ford Thunderbird crew now putting left side tires there. And here's the battle back for turn one. And Davey Allison looks to be the first car with Rusty and this Bodine and then Earnhardt. Yep, that is uh, accurate, Jerry. Good job there. Davey did win the battle out of the pits. Allison wins the race off pit road and holds off Rusty Wallace to lead the final 88 laps. Is out. The hill is going to be there where Rusty would like to be. Down on the inside, he can't get down there as low as he would like to get. So that's right. The last time he was right down there where Hillen was. Allison leads down the back stretch. Rusty looks to the inside in turn number three. Will it be Allison or Wallace? Here they come off the fourth turn. It is going to be Davy Allison winning by about a car length over Rusty Wallace job for the driver. They say that these guys aren't athletes, but he certainly played hurt today. Well, I certainly think he proved it today. You know, he started complaining around about cramps, caution with about 75 to go, and he just kept drinking liquids and kept rubbing his muscles and all, and uh, I can't say enough for this entire Texaco Havlin team, considering the week we've had since Bristol a week ago. I mean, it's phenomenal. You know, i got to say thanks to Jimmy Hensley for coming in and practicing this car and qualifying it for us. He gave us a great starting spot. Car worked good all day. You know, he's a great race car driver, and I hope somebody out there will give him a break, give him a sponsor to run his Bush Grand National car, maybe get him in one of these Winston Cup cars. They say athletes play hurt. You played hurt today and came out on top. Uh, you had some cramps late in the race. They weren't sure you were going to be able to make it. Yeah, my left leg started cramping real bad in my thigh and in my calf, and, and I couldn't stretch my leg out, so I couldn't couldn't rub either one of them to get them worked out. You know, I just kept mashing on the foot rest down here, and it finally went away. Uh, when they threw the green flag, it was just take care of the race car and take care of myself the rest of the day. Uh, Allison wins his second race of the year and takes rank number one among the big three. Kowicki led the most laps, but would have to settle for a seventh-place finish. What had to be a disappointment on Junior Johnson Appreciation Day, his lead driver, Elliot, would finish 20th. Also, this was Ford's seventh win in a row, or 11th if you go back to the previous season. Elliot would slip to third points behind leader Allison, with Kowicki still holding fifth place. Martinsville in race number eight. Scheduling conflicts with the 1992 NFL draft meant they were unable to carry the race live forcing ESPN to air the race on tape the next day. Last time a NASCAR race was not carried live. Darrell Waltrip was on pole, but it would be Darrell Earnhardt who would lead the first 60 laps. And in keeping with the trend of the previous two races, Richard Petty found trouble early. Man, what a grip. Earnhardt got off that second corner. He just might try to dive into the inside and lead this first lap. He is going to lead this first lap. Richard Petty has spun in turn number four. The car is on the grass in the area between turns three and four. Was any contact or not? Yeah, yep. we can see him getting booted by Hamilton. Uh, I tell you what, Richard just cannot get a break. Well, that's three in a row. Yep, Bristol early right. in the race, North Wilkesboro early in the race, and here on the very first lap. Davey Allison goes for a spin on lap 58. Turn one. Lots of room. They go in the corner. All of a sudden, they just make slight contact. Around goes both those cars. And Dale Jarrett has no place to go. This race was also remembered as Camber Day, with new trick rear ends tilted slightly to help get better drive through the corners.
Amber Greer and Housing begin in the previous season, most notably from Harry Gant and the number 33 team. Check out my In the Spotlight video, Harry Gant Life Begins at 51 for more detail. As teams caught on to the trick, they began pushing the limits, and it was never more evident than in this race after car after car had issues. Unfortunately, the attrition rate continues to climb, Bob. Ricky Rudd currently 10th in the point standing, sitting in the car behind the wall. Gary Dehart and the rest of the tight crew beneath the rear of the car, as you see, they are replacing the gear. Dehart says apparently something broke in the gear. Alan Kowicki had led 219 laps and dominated the first half of the race before he fell victim to the cambered rear housing issues. Something's wrong with Kowicki. Kowicki's car slowed coming off the fourth corner. He has... Ernie Irvin has went by before the, he has the lead. Now Earnhardt is on the outside, and he goes by. And Now they are speculating, Benny, that he may have broken an axle in the car number seven. Only He only has uh, one wheel pulling coming off the corner. That's why he's not back up to speed. The crew now getting set to bring Ellen Quickie behind the wall. And what a tough break after this car being so dominant on the short track the past couple of races. You know, these cars anymore with the radial tires, they're running special rear ends. They're running cambered rear ends. They run, they tilt the, ins, the top of the right rear end, the top of the left rear out to try to get more traction on the rear tires on some of these racetracks. And that puts a lot of abuse on the axle shaft and the axle flange, the thing that drives the car. Alan Kowicki is out of the car walking around, and apparently it was not an axle problem. They had stripped the drive plate. So Benny Parsons' speculation was correct. They used the cambered rear ends, and in Richmond early in the year, a number of teams have problems with the drive plate. That was exactly what the problem was in the right rear of the Hooters Ford. Back at Martinsville, and all of a sudden we have a battle for the lead as Irvin has serious challenge from Dale Earnhardt. It's like Ernie Irvin's brakes have went away or something. I don't know exactly, but his car is slowing and slowing, and he's quick. The car's running down the straightaway because he's able to keep up with Earnhardt, but there goes Dale Vine, new leader. Still. But with just 40 laps to go, if they're going to stop with just 40 laps to go, I mean, one can of gas, but one, you don't even have to have a whole can of gas to do that, so I think he got Ernie almost done. He's yes. off the pace. He has. He's lost second position to Mark Martin. He's ripped a flange plate or something. He's coming in. So once again, speculation has to be that maybe something in the rear gearing, an axle problem, maybe a drive, but like we saw with Alan Kowicki, could be a problem. Gentlemen, having the lead is not the place to be today. We've seen it. going to play the strategy. Is someone going to stop early? There's Dick Prickle off the pace. Now, as he lost it, it looks like he's lost an axle flange or something. All of a sudden, See, the watch him go up there and almost run. Poor old Dave Marcus and Labonte. Oof. Very slow down the front straightaway. Trouble for another driver among the big three. And Davey Ellis, the points leader, is in the wall coming off turn two. Some heavy damage to the Avalon Ford. He went in there big time and is up against the outside wall coming. I don't know if he cut a tire down or had one to go down or what happened, Bob, but. Well, Davey, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine, John. Uh, I just re bruised my ribs a little bit, but everything's okay. You know, I felt the tire start, the right front tire start to get a little soft, so I backed off and let Daryl go, and it just let go all at once, no warning. And now, let's get back to the cambered rear housing issues. Listen to Jerry, as he mentions, one car that has not had any issues as of yet. Do some of the chassis out here because it's been over again. We see Earnhardt Wigland. He's slow. He's definitely off the base. Earnhardt is off the base. Yes, he is dropping and back. And Mark Martin, Martin back. takes the lead. As we have seen now three times this afternoon, the lead is not the place to be. Kowicki, Urban, and now Earnhardt. Jerry, what's wrong? As I said just a minute ago, Bob, he is one of those five cars that had a two and a half degree camber setting in the rear end. Three of the five that already had axle problems now make it four out of five. The only one left on the track and has not experienced a problem yet. The 26 car at Brentwood Island. They are telling me here in the good Smith that it looks like it's probably an axle or drive plate at Earnhardt. There are moments that serve as reminders just how dangerous the sport can be and the type of community that exists among the teams and drivers. The first two people to reach the car to help Kyle Petty, Jeff Bodine with a fire extinguisher, and a crew member from Wally Dollenbach's team. Continues to burn, a lot of fire. And now Kyle successfully escapes. But that's why the falls, Keystone, 
That's one of the Keystone pit crewmen over there getting help in Kyle Petty out of the car. That is one of uh, Wally Dollenbach's crew members who came across the track to help Kyle Petty get out of his blazing race car. Who is that in the, with the red hat? Is that Jeff Bodine? Is that, that looks like Jeff Bodine with a fire extinguisher. Well, these fellows will always come to help each other anytime they possibly can. Remember, Mark Martin is second to Brett Bodine as the green flag comes out for the Bodine march. goes high in the turn. Oh, mercy. And again, a leader has problems, and now Mark Martin. Could Bodine be experiencing the same problems that all those other cars have had? Remember, Jerry? I do believe it's the same problem. Yeah. Oh, he almost goes up, hits the wall that time. He got too much speed. Man, oh, man. That car is all over the racetrack. One more lap around this half-mile racetrack that has been exquisitely prepared, as per usual, by track owner Clay Earls. Here is Mark Martin as we ride with him with a half a lap to go. wins the Haynes 500. He had his left hand out waving at the crowd. He didn't have his right hand waving to us, unfortunately. And there is a happy crew, to say the least. And a happy Jack Roush team in victory lane. Jack Roush standing beside his victorious driver, Mark Martin. Mark, congratulations on an outstanding effort. Well, it was a really a great run. And I tell you what, I want to thank Goodyear for putting us on the best race tires I've ever been on. Uh, they were great today, never gave up. A uh, car worked beautiful, and, uh, you know, I just thank Valvoline for hanging in there with us and, and Folgers, and, uh, you know, we brought it home. You know, it was a good day for us. The whole team has kept their chin up through uh, times when things weren't working like they should, and if they'd have let that, if, that'll, if they would have let that get them down, we wouldn't have won today, and I'm real proud of them for being that strong. So Mark Martin, first driver outside the big three to win a race. Ford extended its winning streak to 8th straight for the season and 12th straight overall. Now for the big three, Elliott would take rank number one for the fifth time with his 10th place finish. Kawiki finished 16th and Allison finishes 26th after crashing out. Allison's lead in the points shrunk to 16 over Harry Gant and Terry Labonte moved into third as Elliott dropped to fourth with Kawiki maintaining fifth. Talladega, race number nine. Ernie Irvin won the pole, but it would be Davey Allison who led the first lap, the first of 110 laps he led in this 188-lap race. Further Marlin, in the number 22 car, would lead 54 laps, but Allison dominated all day. One of the more memorable moments came late in the race with Jimmy Spencer. Jimmy Spencer, some of our spotters a moment ago was... I heard something is oh, oh, in trouble. Look out. Jimmy Spencer is the car in trouble. Car lifting. Oh, but it did not go over. Unbelievable. Whoa. Oh. Unbelievable. The car was had to go over. Oh. And look, just put it in gear and go on, Jimmy. What a ride that had to be. Still no movement. They run nose to tail down the back stretch. Let's see what happens now at the end of the back stretch as they set into the 33 degrees of banking of turn number three. Ernie Irvin looking to the inside. There goes Dale Earnhardt to the outside. Ernie will follow him. Dale slides way up on the racetrack. He's in a battle for second position with Bill Elliott. They move off of turn number four and come down through the trioval. Davey Allison still has the lead. He's trying to break the draft. It looks like he's going to win it. Battle for second between Elliott and Earnhardt. Here's the checker flying and Davey Allison wins it. Second place goes to Elliott. Third place to Earnhardt. Fourth, I believe, to Marlin and fifth to Earn to Urban. Everything paid off. Texaco Havilland Thunderbird handled great all day. We didn't even make any adjustments at all. Didn't even put tires on the last cost and just filled it up with gas. The car drove great. Allison's third win of the season made him the only remaining contender for the Winston Million. He had claimed two of the legs required to claim the one million bonus from Winston the Daytona 500, and the Winston 500. He would have two shots at the bonus, Charlotte and Darlington. This was a ninth straight victory for Ford this season and 13th overall. Allison takes rank number one for the third time among the big three, with Elliott finishing second and Kawiki finishing sixth. Elliott jumped back to second in points, 67 behind leader Allison, with Kawiki now moving up to fourth. We take a break from the regular season, for the all-star race at Charlotte, one of the most famous all-star races in the history of the event. 
it earned the nickname One Hot Night. Also making the race even more historic, lights, as Charlotte became the first non-short track to host night racing. Davey Allison won, but he won in shocking fashion. I would prefer to play the final lap for you, but it's copyrighted, so the best I can do is describe the action over screenshots. Final lap of the All-Star Race, Daryl Earnhardt is leading, Kyle Petty second, Davey Allison third. Petty has a run to Earnhardt's inside, but gets blocked off the track, so Petty's like, if you're going to block, I'm going to give you a tap. Earnhardt spins, and it looks like Petty is going to win, but here comes Allison with tons of momentum at the last turn. He gets to Petty's inside and is able to take the lead just before they cross the finish line. However, as they cross the line, there is contact, sending Allison hard into the wall. He won the race, but paid a heavy price. Allison would spend the night in the hospital instead of victory lane. The crash left Yates Racing in the number 28 team with just one car, a short track car. And Larry McReynolds would approach Tim Brewer, crew chief for Bill Elliott, their championship rival, asking for assistance. Brewer would loan out one of his cars, the number 11 car, that raced and won at Atlanta earlier in the season to the 28 team, which they carried in the top of their hauler as an emergency backup for a month until their fleet could be replenished. Charlotte in race number 10. All eyes focused on Allison after he spent two days in the hospital nursing a broken collarbone, re-injured ribs, and bruises covering 60% of his body. After winning Daytona and Talladega, Allison was eligible for the Winston men if he was victorious at Charlotte in the Coca-Cola 600. That's right, if Davey Allison can win this race this afternoon, he gets a $1 million bonus from Winston. But last Saturday night, he was involved in a grinding crash that knocked him cold at this same racetrack. And the question is, Davey, can you run all 600 miles today? Well, Dick, we've got a million reasons to stay in it, and we're gonna try to take this Texaco have on Thunderbird from back here in 17th place up to the lead and try to win this thing. You know, it's a long day, it's 400 laps. This would be a rough day for the King and his appreciation tour. He would be involved in three cautions during the first 120 laps. The second would come after Alan Kowicki spun on track. Watch those cars scooting, scattering, slithering around him here. Look at Brett Bodine getting down. Okay, we just see Ricky Rudd clear him. Okay, watch Richard Petty back there in the back. He's trying to get slowed down, he's looping it around. And he luckily doesn't get into anything either. Remember, we heard earlier that he has a brake problem on number 43, and it looked like one of them didn't hit you up that time. Here comes Spencer out of four. Just saw Mike Walker and another car get together coming out of four right in the middle of this big pack right here. There's Mark coming out there. Watch this. He run up on his track. See him hold his hand up. Somebody hit him in the rear. He's going around down in the corner. That's just that you saw it just as it happened. Mark threw his hand up. Several cars going to the wall down there. Derek Cope getting hit. Strickland's in it again, and Richard Petty. You were riding at 180 miles an hour with a Valvoline car when he got hit. Now they're racing back to the line. At this point, the King said, you know what? I think that'll do it for the day. Something special happens, and I really felt like this would be, I thought Richard would have a good week here, good run, but he's had a little bit of trouble. In the late stages, Kyle Petty and Ernie Irvin battled for first and second with Dale and Hart running third, about three seconds behind. After the final round of pit stops, Dale and Hart moved in front of both Kyle Petty and Ernie Irvin. Al, did he make up three seconds on pit road? Some believe he was speeding, but not penalized. I don't know, maybe he just had a really fast pit stop. Either way, Earnhardt comes out with the lead. Somewhat further back on the field, but he isn't out of this thing by any stretch. Here they go in the third turn. We'll be able to tell right here, Ken, if these guys are going to come in. This could be a bad deal for Ernie Irvin. He wanted to pit right then, but the 21 car was under him, and he couldn't get in. He was going to pit with Kyle, he but he got moved got out. He finally got in, but it really cost him some time. The jack goes up on the car. Left side, this is a quick pit stop so far. Second can, and again, just to make sure it's full. Kyle Petty drops it away. A great pit stop. Pitting number three. He slides it to a halt. Watch this stop by... That Richard Childress crew, Kurt Schaumadine and company, putting them through their paces. It's going to take two laps for us to be able to tell what kind of stop Dale has compared to theirs because it's going to take him a while to get back up to speed. For a race fan, it's poetry in motion. Four tire change, less than 20 seconds. Tank of fuel and Earnhardt comes out. Times in the pits. 
This may be one of those sometimes. Dale Earnhardt is currently in front of Kyle Petty in second place. Ernie Irvin is in third. Davey Allison finds himself fourth. And Dick Trickle is in fifth. It was Earnhardt's pit stop and the work of his pit crew that has given him the advantage. It was a brilliant Earnhardt would hold on to lead the final 54 laps to post his first and only win of 1992. White flag. Final lap is underway. Urban settles down and won. He's got one more shot to take. It's still Earnhardt in front. Remember what happened to Earnhardt just a week ago on Saturday night with $300,000 at stake when he came to turn three. He's away He's got here. a good lead. He got a good jump off that corner. That was Dale's end. This is the end for number four, Ernie Irvin. He's better in this corner. But it looks like he drove it in there. The car got up a little high. Down to finish the 33rd annual Coca-Cola 600. And by three, four car lengths, Dale Earnhardt has come home the winner. So GM, after being shut out through nine races, gets on the board with Chevrolet's first win of the season. The last 10 or so laps, you had Ernie Irvin all over you, Dale. I was driving and doing everything I could. Uh, finally, finally we made it back to here. Been working hard at it. Uh, you know, it's just uh, hard to believe we hadn't won a race till now. And it's just been, you know, hard work on our part. The good wrench crew, Richard, Ed and Lanier, and all the guys. This is the car we ran in the wheels, and they fixed it, and they come back and won this race. I can't say enough for them. How important was that? Allison finished fourth in his bid for the one million bonus, but still had one more chance to win the Winston Million later in the season at Darlington. The fourth place finish for Allison would give him rank number one among the big three for the fourth time. Kawiki finished seventh and Elliott 14th. Allison's point lead increased to 111 over second place Elliott and Kawiki maintained fourth. Dover and race number 11. Rain would delay the start and give Dale Earnhardt a chance to address the issue of how he made up three seconds on pit road, allowing him to win the previous race. All right, the second question, let me position myself in front of the door here so he can't get by me. <laughs> no, we want to know. You've been very vocal, uh, very outspoken about the fact that your pit crew won that race for you last week, but yet there's been a lot of talk saying that you were too fast down pit road. Just how did you guys do that uh, last stop so quickly? We didn't get a ticket. <laughs> well, <laughs> really, if you look if you look at the, uh, you know, the replay of it, uh, Kyle and uh, uh, Ernie had to dodge uh, Morgan getting in the pit, so that really took some time up. I came in really good and clean and had a real clean pit stop. The guys did a super job, even old as they are. Uh, they did a good job. And uh, <laughs> then uh, I got off the pit road good, and I really ran hard around the bottom of one and two, and I right against the berm, filling the berm as I was going, sort of like running on dirt against the berm. And when I got around far enough, I just let it up on the track, and we was going good. So we probably picked up a half sec, second, a half second, half second getting in, and a, I know a good second getting out. So we beat them there and beat them a little bit in the pits. Well, how about that, guys? Dirt track experience helped him win the World 600. I'll Steve Evans? <laughs> the race finally gets started, and on lap 120, Kyle Petty hammers the wall. I did a In the Spotlight video on Dave Marcus titled Everybody Loves Dave. Felix Sabatis would differ on that opinion. Trouble. Oh, me? Wham. Man, he hit hard. Hard into the wall. Kyle Petty turned four. Ooh. Smacked the outside wall. Came down through the water and to the inside. This is after hitting the wall. Watch that. Here's Earnhardt. Right behind, who is it? Morgan Shepard. Morgan is clear. Earnhardt right through the smoke and the dust to miss Kyle who's about to meet the inside pit wall. Boy, that was no minor lick to the inside once he came out the outside. That's a pretty good shot right on the driver's door of that inside wall. From the in-car, or rather from the pit wall, there's the first impact. You know, I'd like to see that. It looked like a car started to turn down the pits. I'm not so sure that car that turned in the pits didn't, might, might have cut across in front of him. Maybe we could have that angle Take again. I believe, that again. I believe that was Dave Markin. Somebody was turning into pits. Kyle Miner came up on him real quick, but. Race cars you can always replace. Good friends you can, and we understand that he's okay. He's getting checked out, but we understand he's okay. No, Kyle, Kyle is fine. He's the motherfucker. We're going to have to get the car fixed and send it back out. I just don't understand that stupid idiot in the 71 car. That, that's not race. And the guy's an idiot, always been an idiot, will continue to be an idiot. And as long as NASCAR <laughs> let people like him get in the racetrack, you're going to have this kind of problem. He shouldn't be racing. Okay, other than that. 
Felix doesn't have an opinion. Mike? I got an opinion. Thank you, Steve. Okay, there is his car. I think that hauled back to the garage area. And there's Kyle talking to the record drivers. I think he's trying to get that thing positioned so they get some work done on it and get him back in the race. One of the problems, Mike, that's the Bush cars that are lined up right there. Let's go down to Glenn Jarrett. Well, we are standing here with Kyle Petty. Kyle's directing the record right now. He's uh, pretty upset about things down here. The record driver, for some reason, pulled the car down here between these other cars. They cannot get to it. So Kyle has taken it upon himself to uh, direct this record driver here. See if I can get a word with him. First of all, Kyle, you're okay? Yeah, I'm all right. What happened out there? Well, Dave was pitting, and he waved his hand to pit, so I went to the outside of him. And evidently, while he was waving his hand, he hit something and just skated up the racetrack a little bit. It just hit me in the left rear. It wasn't nothing he could do. It wasn't nothing that could have been done. Just one of those things out there today. Well, that's mighty gracious coming from a guy who just took a lick like that. This would turn into a classic fuel mileage race, even though Harry Gant pitted on lap 403 and Darrell Waltrip on lap 406, Gant would outlast Waltrip somehow. Andy Petrie must have had some innovation in that car is what I'm thinking. Must be a strip look -up. Yeah, they're still gonna come around now to the left side. They've got a strip up. This is a really bad break. Oh, man. Harry, Gant. Harry Gant, Ernie Irvin are in, and Gant went uh, just over the line of his pit ever seen in a given race, the mileage enters into it right here. Seen the lead completely turn around on a group of cars. Here comes Darrell in pits right now. He will hand the lead over to Terry Labonte for the first time today. That side lug nuts coming off as the right side tires are changed. One can of fuel in, here goes the second can in. Jeff Hammond around with the jack. Yank it on that tire, get it off. One on. Fuel done. Boy, it works perfect. Fuel may have finished the same time the car does. 21 2, good stop. Darrell opening up a little bit of daylight. He has to run uh, four laps less on this tank of fuel than Gaston. Uh, that could be significant. And these cars will do that. In the corners, they'll pick up that fuel. Look at Gant moving to the inside. It stopped running halfway down the straightaway. There There's Darrell in the picture already. Three laps to go. Gonna hold that gas can. <laughs> We're gonna hold it all the way home. One car slow in the back straightaway. That's Jeff Bodine. Daryl's slowing. Two laps this time by. Waltrip. Car. Waltrip's out of gas. The guy that thought he could make it out and the other one's still running. Two laps to go for Harry Gant. Waltrip will have to pit. He has a lap on Earnhardt. Well, I'll tell you what, he knows there's just a few laps ago. He's going to coast as far as he can because you lose two laps, a lap by pitting. He's going to coast because there's just one more lap to go. Jeff Bodine has coasted into the pits out of fuel. Bud Moore's team to fuel him. Waltrip puttering around down on the flat. Don't count out Earnhardt. If Gant runs out of gas, it's Dale. One lap to go. White flag for Harry Gant. He needs a quart of gas. Oh, man. Apparently up. Out of turn two. Back straight away. There's Waltrip. He goes a lap down. Look at Here comes Earnhardt. Earnhardt. Here comes Earnhardt to unlap himself. Earnhardt moves to second. Gant can roll and coast down the bank into the Gant line. Now. He's out of gas. Earnhardt comes by. Harry Gant coasts across the line to win the Budweiser 500. After Chevrolet got on the board last race, Oldsmobile will get their first win of the season. Yeah, we were running out of gas there uh, towards the end, and they, when I was following Darrell there in second place, they told me to, you know, to, to conserve fuel about 70 laps to go, and so that's what I tried to do. But when I got in front, I, I wanted to run a little bit harder, and uh, then they said, hey, "You're pulling away." He said, "Back off, back off." So 10 to go, I just run apart throttle, you know. Then the three laps to go, it was running out all the way around. Landy Petri thought for sure they'd have to bring in. He didn't think he could make it at one point. Well, it would quit going in the first turn here, but then when you went in the corner and they'd go up the back stretch and the fuel pressure would come back up and it would cut off over here again and you never give it to us. It'll never make that last lap. I'm give him one right <laughs> Oh, boy. Carl, great job. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Among the big three, Allison took rank number one for the fifth time with his 11th place finish. Kawiki would finish 12th and Elliott 13th. Allison's point lead was shrinked to 70 points to Harry Gant, who jumped to second, and Earnhardt jumped to third, dropping Elliott to fourth and Kawiki to fifth. 
Sonoma, also known as Sears Point, in race number 12. On the day of this race, NASCAR founder Bill French Sr. died. It is with heavy hearts that we announce today the death of William H.G. France, the father of stock car racing and a leader in motorsports worldwide. He died at his home today in Ormond Beach, Florida. Affectionately known as Big Bill, he took stock car racing off the back roads and dirt tracks and turned it into a major league sport that has reached phenomenal heights in a 45-year span. He was a founder of NASCAR and wanted to build the world's fastest speedway. He did at Daytona and Talladega. NASCAR flourished under France's leadership to become the world's largest motorsports sanctioning body. The mood was rather somber here about two hours ago when it was announced to the crews and drivers that the founder of NASCAR had passed away. A man whose determination, charisma, and personality have built this sport we all have grown to know and love to the high seat of today is gone. But to a man, the drivers and crews are determined to go out today and put on the kind of show that would have made Big Bill proud. Bill France was 82 years of age. Ernie Irvin started second in this race, but jumped to start and was given a stop and go penalty in the pits, dropping him to the rear of the field. Just keep that in mind. as they head down to Ned for the first time in turn seven. And he makes a good line into here, but Rudd coming in on the inside, trying to make a pass. But Ernie Irvin might have a problem. He might have jumped Ricky Rudd on the start. Here they come towards me. Ernie still leading Rudd. Well, it was obvious that he was well out in front of the rest of the pack, including the pole center, Ricky Rudd. And yes, indeed, the number four Kodak film Chevrolet comes in for a pit stop. This is a stop and go for Ernie Irvin. Davey Allison, the defending winner of this race, would have a terrible day starting on lap nine. He brings it in with a considerable amount of damage. The tire is rubbing. This is the Winston Cup points leader. And Jerry, let's show you what happened. Benny, it happened right up there by you, didn't it? Right direct in front of me, just like Corelli. He came off of turn 8B, we'll call it. Down it. He lost the back end, was never able to get it back. Did a, a slow 180 and hit Brennan. Davey Allison, a lap down. In 25th position. Oh, and oh, on the run. Davy spins. And been spinning in front of those other cars, but he catches it before it goes back out on the racetrack. The Winston Cup points leader having his problems here at Sears Point. Irvin came through the entire field to take the lead from Terry Labonte with eight laps remaining. Haven't gone very well for him. Look out, he, he's got him on the inside, I believe, this time. Urban has the lead. Whoa! From the back to the front. Ernie Irvin about to win his fourth Winston Cup event. He comes down toward turn number 11, his final difficult area of the racetrack that he must negotiate before accelerating to the start-finish line, in this case, the finish line. Here he is, Ernie Irvin, off of corner number 11. He sees the checkered flag from starter Doyle Ford, and here it is! the checkered waves and Ernie Irvin has won the St. Martin Supermarket 300. Irvin gets his first win of the season, second for Chevrolet, and in doing so, set a record for the fastest Winston Cup race held on the 2.52 mile version of Sears Point at two hours, 17 minutes. Modesto, California native Ernie Irvin gets out. Ernie, congratulations on an outstanding effort. I tell you, you know, uh, we, we had a bad start there at the start I went when the green flag dropped and uh, no, that's not when you go but you know Tony just kept me calm all day and we had a good race car I don't know how we did it but we did Richard Petty's 21st place finish made him the last car on the lead lap the final race where the king would finish on the lead lap Elliott would take rank number one for the sixth time among the big three with his fifth place finish Kawiki finished 14th and Allison 28th the bad day for Allison tightened up the points even more as Earnhardt jumped to second, just 28 points behind as Elliott moved up to third with Kawiki holding in fifth place. Pocono in race number 13. Ken Schrader was on pole and led the first 15 laps.
So far, so good. Straighter out to about a 10 car length advantage. And meanwhile, Morgan Shepard and Mark. Dale Earnhardt had a guest in attendance for this race, none other than James Tiberius Kirk. Who said that? Elias Captain Kirk from the Starship Enterprise and uh, appearing here at the Bucks County Playhouse, Pocono Playhouse in Love Letters. And I want to call you Captain Kirk, but, but you can call me Captain Kirk if you can hear me. <laughs> this is my first uh, race, and I can understand why it's the fastest growing sport in the country. Instead of Captain Kirk, maybe Earnhardt needed engineer Scotty. You know, how Scotty worked on engines. This would be a common scene for the three car during the remainder of the season. Earnhardt brings the car in very deliberately. Remember, he's on seven cylinders. But we can show you what the offending problem was. Rock, rocker arm broken on cylinder number three. The rocker arm is sheared off here as you hear more. Two of the big three would emerge late in the race as they battled for the lead. Wicky had taken four tires in the last pit stop, while Elliott took only two tires. Wicky would take the lead, but lap traffic almost cost him the race. We are back at Pocono, and Alan Kowicki slipped a little bit in the tunnel turn, and he's getting passed by both Elliott and Mark Martin. What happened? He started in on the outside of James Hilton. That's the slower car that you see around the right of the screen. He got in the loose stuff and almost hit the wall and let both those cars go by. Here he is. He's going down the straightaway. James Hilton is going to be a slower car going in the tunnel corner. Okay. Okay, on, James, where are you? <laughs> Come on. Here Kowicki goes in the corner. Now Hilton is right in front of him. Kowicki has to move up to go by. He gets in the loose stuff and almost loses. See him get sideways? Oh, yeah. Almost got in the fence, and here comes... Boy, we're set up for a great finish here. Here comes Allen yep. on the inside. Kowicki may get him going into turn number three. He has the inside line, and yes, but Elliott battles back on the outside. And who's Mark Martin going to pick to help? It's a draft and deal. Who are you going to go with? Oh, Martin almost loses it coming off the third turn. I'll tell you, that bug rider Ford has some power down the straightaway, fellas. He really does. Look at him. What's he going to do? Who's going to win this race in the corner? Mark, don't know who to follow. Kowicki will make, make it to turn one first. I think he'll win the race off the corner. Kowicki. Because he's shifting. He's in the in one-to-one -one situation. He's got about 200 RPM advantage over that 11 car now. Just looks to me like Kowicki's having all kinds of problems on that punch for him. Let's see how he negotiates, negotiates it for the final time this afternoon. The crowd is on its feet at Pocono. Here comes Kowicki off of turn number four. The hats are waving. Alan Kowicki takes the checkered flag and wins the champion Spark Plug 500. Second win of the season for Alan Kowicki and the final win of his career. Earlier in the season, I talked about Davey Allison being down to one active car. Well, Kowicki had come into this race having wrecked two cars at Dover in a similar situation. This was actually a short track car that he just won at Pocono with. Great job today. You had that big smile this morning in the garage here. I guess a short track car is the way to go here at Pocono. Well, you know, it's, it's a short track car, but Pocono's a lot like a short track in some ways. It's got a long straightaway, which we've done a transmission, which I made up for that. You know, and the crowd was going nuts. A popular win for you. Congratulations. Uh, you know, I had to work for it a little harder than I wanted to there. You know, we just ran a real deliberate race, and I think we had the best car in a long run. And, uh, I knew that, you know, Bill tried a little different strategy and that was his only shot to win. And we were just a little better than him and Mark. And uh... with the win, Kawiki takes rank number one among the big three for the second time. Elliot would finish third and Allison fifth as his point lead shrunk to 21 over Elliot, who moved back to second while Kawiki broke into the top three of points for the first time. Earnhardt, who had jumped to second in points after the previous race, dropped to fifth after mechanical troubles. Ford, having failed to win the previous three races, returns to victory lane for their 10th win of the season. Michigan in race number 14. Davy Allison was on pole and would dominate the day, leading 158 of 200 laps. There was a bit of a moment early in the race when it appeared that Allison got loose underneath Ernie Irvin. Oh, it's sideways. Gets it? No, he does not. He's in the wall. Hard. Here we are, another angle of it. It did look like they got together right coming off the corner. 
Years later, it would come out that Irvin and Allison did not really care for one another. I don't know if it began prior to 1992, but considering how things transpired during this season, I'm certain it did not help their relationship at all. Ernie, it's a tough way to start the race. How did you get into the trouble back there? Well, I mean, I drove in on the outside of the 28 car, and I don't know if he got loose or uh, what. Well, got in my quarter pound. Um, I get headed sideways off two. Thought I could maybe save her and just didn't quite get her together. And for the second race in a row, someone's having issues <laughs> passing James Hilton. James, get out of the way, man. Thank you to run pulling up on James Hilton out here at number 48, that Beltro car. Built back in 1985 for Bobby Allison, the old Stavola car. Boy, Terry got up there and had nowhere to go. He just had to uh, run up there and slow down. Battled for 31st back there. And that was quite a gesture. He was motioning for James Hilton to move over. You saw Michael. Well, I tell you, it is tough. It's, it's, you know, you're praying, hey, please hang on. Just give me enough to make one more lap. As he gets that white flag this time around, all we like is two miles. If they even get me back into turn three, I believe I can coast the rest of the way. It's bad enough to get beat by another car, but you don't want to get beat by your own car running out of fuel. Down to three and six ten seconds as he eases back on the throttle just a little more. Eases back like 180 miles per hour in the back straightaway. After his 17th career win, Davey Allison, current Winston Cup point leader where he's been ever since that great Daytona 500 run he had to be outset of the season. Here's Allison streaking around. Final moments coming down. Looking for that bonus. Looks like he's going to nail it. Here he comes out of turn number four. And for the second straight year, the winner of the Michigan 400 is from the Alabama gang. Allison gets his fourth win of the season and his final win from the pole position. Also, this would be the last time ever Darrell Waltrip would finish second in a cup race. Watch Chris Economaki take control of victory lane here. No other way. Here we are in victory lane. And it's a <laughs> Get your arm out of the Bobby, shot, you goof. Davey Allison, you look calm and cool. Was it a tough day? I tell you, Chris, this Texaco Havlin Thunderbird prepared by Larry McReynolds and Robert Yates and all the guys back at the shop was so easy to drive today. You know, it, it's almost scary that the car was so fast. And we just... Allison takes rank number one among the big three for the sixth time, with Kawiki finishing third and Elliott finishing tenth. For the first time in several races, Allison would extend his points lead, now 67 ahead of Elliott and 73 ahead of Kawiki. Daytona and race number 15. The race was attended by President George H.W. Bush. Our Grand Marshal, the President of the United States, Mr. President. Read my lips. Start your engines. A special ceremony was held during the pre-race festivities honoring Richard Petty's final race at Daytona. Petty had spent time for the race testing at Daytona in hopes that he might win the pole position and possibly be a factor in the race. He held the provisional pole for quite some time and ultimately qualified second to Sterling Marlin who had set on the pole for the Daytona 500. For racing here at Daytona, and here is the diehard starting lineup. The pole sitter is Sterling Marlin in the Maxwell House Coffee Ford at 189.366, car number 22. On the outside of row number one, there he is, the king, Richard Petty. First time on the front row since 1984. Richard. Guys, we've been talking about Richard Petty, but one guy on Thursday kind of stole the show. That's Sterling Marlin, who knocked Richard off of the pole late in qualifying by about a tenth of a second. Now, when Sterling got out of that race car after doing that, the 15,000 fans who so in attendance all booed Sterling. It's not that they don't like him. It's because they wanted to see the king, Richard Petty, start this race from the pole. The fans may have been booing during qualifying, but come race day, they would be cheering as the King did not disappoint by turning back the clock to lead at Daytona one more time. Richard Petty has the lead going into turn one. He's got it so far. And the crowd is going to burst with enthusiasm and response and applause that this place has not seen in years if he has that lead coming down the trioval on lap number one. He moves over so to hopefully to stay in front of these guys, but Sterling Marlin pulls up on the outside. We just switched the starting order. They go two by two through the banking in turns three and 
four. Petty to the inside. Sterling Marlin to the outside. Here they come down off the banking to about to complete lap number one. Who is going to have the lead? They're side by side as they come down. Richard Petty is going to lead it. Eddie would lead the first five laps. The final laps he led of his career. Hail to the king. And in an illustration of how fickle fans can be, they would cheer as Daryl and Hart would fall out of the race. If you win too much, eventually the fans will turn on you. Winston Cup champion Bob, I just talked to the Danny Lawrence and the folks here in the Goodrich crew. As a crowd, you can hear the crowd behind me responding and waving as they see that black Goodrich Chevrolet. It's been so dominant for so many years in NASCAR racing, rolling to a halt. The engine is not running. In a what might have been, Richard Petty, suffering from heat-related fatigue, would get out of the car. The 43 team needed a relief driver and initially looked for Dale Earnhardt. Now, the fans may have cheered when a three-car dropped out, but I have to believe they would have gone into a frenzy if Dale Earnhardt had gotten into the 43 car at Daytona to finish this race. As iconic as that moment would have been, it did not happen. They're looking for a relief driver. They're trying to find Dale Earnhardt, but Robbie Lewis just told me they'd settle for just about anybody right now. We speculated on the possibility of a relief driver. John, is that what they're setting up for? That's exactly right, Bob. They found Eddie Beerswell. Eddie Beerswell goes into the race cars. The team works on the left side. Now, they were concerned. At first, they thought about Buddy Baker, but the seat was not wide enough for Baker, so they had to go down pit road, look for Jimmy Means, Dale Earnhardt. Couldn't find them. They finally found Eddie Beerswell. I'm not sure, but I think they just called Buddy Baker a fat A. Ernie Irvin would dominate the majority of this race, leading 117 of 160 laps. He's within less than a car length. All right, Dale Jarrett's hoping he can get close enough and he'll get side by side and he can make that move that he made earlier when he took the beat. That's where that was Davey Allison and Ernie Irvin then, but I don't think Jarrett's going to get that close this time. Off the banking of turn number two, down the back stretch for the final time. Irvin stretches it out just a little bit. Let's see what happens behind as Dale Jarrett hangs on to third position. Irvin has the lead as they head for turn number three, still keeping about a two or three car length separation between himself and Sterling Marlin. Jarrett is working the high side. Bodine and Elliott are low. Here they come off the banking. This will decide who wins the Pepsi 400. The checkered flag is out. Ernie Irvin wins it. Irvin picks up his second win of the season and third for Chevrolet. Victory Lane, and again, we got some goof in the camera shot. Different network, same issues. With her interview, here is Dr. Jerry Punch. And Ernie Irvin climbing out of this car, and uh, folks uh, believe me, he is quite hot, but he's also quite excited. Ernie, congratulations on an outstanding effort today. I tell you, you know, um, I kept telling everybody it was going to be a handling race, and uh, the guy that could hold it wide open all day was going to be the guy that win, and I never thought anybody could hold it wide open all day, but Tony set this car up. We didn't run the last practice, and um, they threw the green, and it was wide open from then on. How did the big three do? Elliott would take the number one rank for the seventh time, finishing fifth. Allison finished 10th, and Kawiki 30th. Allison's point lead would be reduced to 46 points ahead of Elliott, with Kawiki 134 points back. Pocono in race number 16. Wait, weren't we just here? Remember earlier when talking about the Atlanta win for Bill Elliott, and things just go your way, you begin to think, this may be my season after fighting Victor Lane for the 15th place car. This was one of those races where afterwards, Davey Allison had to start thinking the opposite. As it appeared, everything was going against him. Allison had set a track record when he put the number 28 car on pole and would lead 115 of the first 139 laps. However, things begin to go a bit sideways during a pit stop. Caution is out at Pocono for the second time this afternoon. Yeah, they should be able to make it on one more pit stop from here, Bob. At least they fixed the lights on yep. the truck. <laughs> Here comes Davey and Ricky and Allen and everybody else. Jerry Punch is in the 28 pit. Actually, Davey Allison and Ricky Rudd, the top two cars, will be pitting just nose to tail here at the 15 here by the Havilland crew. 
Likewise, four tires will be going on the tied Chevrolet, pitting just behind Davy Allison. Right side tires going on. One can of fuel in. Very critical they get the car completely full of fuel here for the Havilland crew. Now Ricky Rudd's team changing left side tires. Right behind the leader, Davy Allison. Left side wheel being rolled up, bolted on, getting ready to pull the jack. Seven car is in and out. Kowicki is out of the way. Rudd is out of the way. Meanwhile, they're still working on the Havilland car. And now the car stalls for Davy. He refires it and pulls away. It costs him about an extra seven or eight seconds. He lost several positions. Yes, he did. He lost about five or six positions. An issue with an air gun cost Allison the lead, and he restarted seventh on lap 146. But his car was so good, it was just a matter of time till he worked his way back to the front. And he quickly moved up to fourth by lap 148. Allison looking to the inside of Waltrip at the end of the main straightaway. Let's see if he picks up that spot. Yes, Davey now moves to fourth. There we see Davey on the inside. He is on the inside of Derek Cope, trying to get by him. And meanwhile, Darrell Walter right on the back bumper of Davey. And here's Mark Martin and Harry Gann battling for position. And 55 is Ted Musgrave. They all made late pit stops. And 10th, 11th, and 12th there as up front. Kowicki Wallace goes a lot down as Kowicki passes him, and so does Ricky. All right, just staying right on the bumper. Yes. To there right now. Now, before we continue, let's pause for just a moment and examine the relationship between Davy Allison and Darrell Waltrip. I don't know if there was a feud, but certainly a frustration between the two stemming back to the previous season when, as Larry McReynolds put it, Allison flat out dumped Waltrip at Bristol. Allison and Darrell Waltrip trying to root his way under Davy Allison, and he does it. So Ricky Rudd now is in the lead. Waltrip, ooh, Waltrip had second there for a moment, but slipped coming off the second corner. Now he gets it again, and Davey Allison is back to third. He and Davey Mason, oh! And Waltrip goes around. Nice save, didn't hit anything. As we know, drivers never forget. Rusty gets out of the way now, Cotton Penny. To the guardrail, side over side, end over end, and Davy Allison. Here's my take, and I'll try to be as objective as a Davy Allison fan can be. Allison had just passed Waltrip, and then Waltrip comes back at him with a great run, which Allison chose to block. You often hear about give and take between drivers. However, after their history, I believe Waltrip was in full take mode. Could have lifted, could have kept from spinning Allison across his nose, but that's not how it went. Also, back then, in NASCAR, you blocked at your own peril. In today's NASCAR, the unwritten code seems to be you get one block, and whatever happens next is on you. Back in the 90s, you may or may not get even one block attempt. It all depended on who you were blocking. And Darrell Waltrip is trying to go by on the inside of Davey Allison. And Davey comes down to try to block that to that move, and just some contact there, and just as soon as that car touched the grass, it flew. Turned over. The 28 car flipped 11 times, eventually landing upside down with gasoline leaking from the rear. Allison suffered a broken right forearm, a dislocated wrist, a skull fracture, and a severe concussion. And guess who went on to win the race? Here is Daryl Waltrip still the speed on the long pond straightaway headed for turn number two. He stretched out a little bit over Darrell as he went through turns one and two. That's Someone the car into the tunnel, oh, tunnel oh, turn. It's almost like Harry ran out of gas for something coming off that corner. He's got just a, another corner to, to manipulate and then on to the long straightaway and halfway down it for the checkered flag. Yeah, he stretched out now over Harry Gand and the Western Auto crew. Saying, come on, Daryl, come on, Daryl. Here he comes off of corner number three. Didn't go the rest of the way. Now. He's got it. Daryl Waltrip has won. Daryl Waltrip gets his first win of the season. The worst part for Larry McReynolds, crew chief for Davey Allison, was leaving the track on the way to the hospital to see his driver, something they had done several times already during the season, and looking over at the 17 team celebrating in victory lane. Allison would be hospitalized four days at the time. No one knew 
if and when he would be able to race again. Not excited at all, not happy at all. DW, congratulations. Honey, honey, where are you? Honey, this is, uh, this is for the baby. This is for you and Jessica and the baby. This is wonderful, honey. We made it. On, we did it on gas mileage. Can you imagine? She was worried about her gas mileage because she's figured it all my life. Now you're talking about Stevie, who's back in Franklin yeah. watching at home. Only watching on TV right now, her and Jessica Lee. Love y'all. Now, she's not close enough to have that baby jumping up and down here in his last couple laps. Well, that's pretty close. Sometime, you know, in the next uh, four or five weeks. So, honey, just hold on. I'll be home in a little while. How about the gas mileage? Did you think you could make it? I know Jeff was talking to you. I didn't think we could, but he said we could, so I just kept going, and uh, it ran out on the last lap, and I know people get tired of hearing that, but that's exactly what happened. And coming back in and topping off, that was the, the saving deal for us, but the uh, main thing is, is, is how's Davey doing? You know, he and I got together on that deal over there, but it was nothing I could do. He just kept cutting and cutting, and when we hit, he just turned and went right into the infield, so I don't know, I don't know what y'all saw, but we did get together. Well, that's the first thing. We might tell the folks almost the very first thing Darrell Walter passed when he jumped out of the car here is how's Davey Allison. And we'll tell you, Davey, I think he has a broken right arm and may have a, a fracture above his left eye, but otherwise, he seems to be okay, DW. Well, I'm sorry. Sorry that happened, but, you know, we were all going for the same hoe and uh, just run out of room. Now for the big three. Kawiki would take rank number one for the third time with his third-place finish. Elliot would finish 13th. And after crashing out, Allison finished 33rd. Allison had held the points lead all season. Following the 16th race, we would have a new points leader. Elliott took over first, with Allison dropping to second, nine points behind, and Kawiki in third, 47 points behind. Talladega in race number 17. The track was just up the road from where I lived, so I was at this race. The first question everyone had, how was Davy Allison? Second question, where's Darrell Waltrip? So we can boo him. <laughs> That's the truth. And there's Davy Allison's car. And believe it or not, he's in it. Going to give it a go, despite a shattered arm being in a cast. It's been a remarkable comeback and a remarkable story. For Davy Allison's crash with Darrell Waltrip not only produced physical injuries, but some bruised feelings as well. Friday, when Darrell Waltrip wheeled his car out to qualify, he was greeted with a crescendo of boo. I didn't cause that wreck. I tried to avoid it. I don't drive that way. I think people that know me understand me and know that I don't drive that way. I give a lot more than, I, than I've ever taken. Davey suffered a broken arm and collarbone, but the wreckage shows how very fortunate he was. Yesterday, an upbeat Davey Allison met with the press and offered his view. If y'all want to see it, I'll show them to you, but it's ugly. So, the last thing I remember um, prior to climbing out of the car was seeing Kyle Petty upside down and thinking one of us is not going the right direction. <laughs> Davey said he bears Darrell Waltrip no animosity, but Davey's dad, a former stock car champion, was not so generous. I don't think that that he started the lap saying, boy, I'm going to wreck old Davey. And I don't think that he went into the tunnel turn saying, I'm going to wreck old Davey. And I don't think that he went across behind Davey saying, I'm going to wreck old Davey. But as the thing developed, I think he said, it sure won't hurt to send him out for a little wild ride. Whatever the circumstances were, it doesn't it doesn't deserve going around and calling me names and talking about me being the kind of guy that they say that the Allison say I am. I don't think uh, I don't I, I'm not I'm just not that way. Davy, how are you feeling and how long can you go today? Can't think of any better place to be, Mike. It's, it's great therapy to be back in the car today, and we're running good. Yes. Practice. Bobby Hillen's done a great job for us. All the guys at the shop have done a great job bouncing back from the adversity this week, and we want to win this championship, and that's why I'm here today. NASCAR would like you to run one lap and get out of the car. That way, this car would earn all its points for you as driver. You wanted to run to the first caution flag. Where'd this all sort out? We'll see what happens. <laughs> okay. And as you can tell by now, there was a major election coming up in 1992. The vice president of the United States is about to give the command. Gentlemen, start your engines. Remember that Sonoma race a few races back? 
the one where Ernie Irvin jumped the start, had a stop and go penalty, drove through the field to win the race. Just keep that in mind. On lap five, Irvin had a flat tire. During his trip down pit road, the caution flag came out for rain. Irvin failed to beat the leader back to the line and was tagged for speeding. After it shook out, he was a lap down. The caution allowed Allison to get out of the car after six laps, and Bobby Hillen Jr. took over. What this about you can't pass with restrictor plates? <laughs> Dave, you know, I think NASCAR's been searching around looking for things to make speedway racing better. These these big road spoilers have got them racing all the way around the racetrack. About to go another lap down. Caution is out. A yellow is on the racetrack. Rain. Rain, we understand, in turn one. Break for Davey Allison. Ernie Irvin's going to go a lap down, though, as they come back through the start-finish line. He's trying to get out of the pits and onto the track, but is he going to make it? No, he didn't quite do it. Point line, he did across that line. He had he missed it by about 10 foot. for it. Randy Pemberton is with us today here on our CBS telecast and he's standing by with Davey. Well Davey you did a heck of a job getting on the car. You had to get out by yourself. You did that. What was it like out there for the couple laps you were running? That car will fly. I hope that we get him back out in time get him in good position. <laughs> the brakes go okay today. They got a good shot at winning this race and we're just happy that things have worked out the way they have. Dale Earnhardt had an engine failure again and finished last for the second time in three races. It appeared the grind of the previous six seasons that produced four championships and 37 wins had finally caught up with the number three team. Another cool what might have been, after Earnhardt dropped out of the race, he waited around as a possible substitute driver for Richard Petty. However, the King was able to finish this race Stop. Oh, Earnhardt's car coming through the trial. Yeah, Earnhardt is definitely off the pace. Slowing down as he goes to turn one, way up against the wall. Something is amiss with Earnhardt. Car slowing down. Well, oh, his woes continue. I don't know if it was an engine or what, what might have been the problem. But... So the problems that Dale Earnhardt has sustained over the past few months continue to badger the gentleman. One to 600. He said to his pit crew on the radio, I'm blown up. The race only saw two yellows, a lap six for rain, and lap 70 for oil on the track. The long green runs caused the field to spread out, leaving only three cars on the lead lap. Ernie Irvin, who had gotten his lap back earlier, Sterling Marlin, and Bobby Hillen Jr. filling in for Davey Allison. The white flag is out. One more lap. Doyle Ford says, gentlemen, go for it. This is it. That orange, number four, in front. Sterling Marlin trying to find a hole and pull in here. But he has has a bumper there. That bumper is the car number five of Ricky Rudd. He's got to pass him before he can get to the four car. Got him in a, so him in a box right there now. Yeah, Harry Gant down on the inside. He's got a lot of General Motors cars around him, and uh, it's going to be tough. But remember where the truck finish line is. It's a long way down there. 190 mile per hour chess game is... Sterling Marlin tries to sort it out through the fourth turn. Here they come for the try over. Down in the final lap. The first diehard 500 victory for Carr, number four. Let's see if he's going down to the bottom. Comes Sterling Marlin, but he's still six car lengths back at the finish. And Ernie Irvin holds him off to take it home. Irvin wins his third race of the season. This was three in a row for Chevrolet as they took their fifth win of 1992. And here's the man who won it, the smiling Ernie Irvin. Irvin. Journey, but what about the beginning when you were way down there, behind, got a penalty? Did you ever think you could pull it off? Well, basically, a penalty didn't matter because we got a flat tire. So put us in the back of the pack and just had to try to work our way up. And uh, oh, a lot of uh, what happened today to a lot of the guys that helped me out through the pack. And uh, our car was fast, but it needed help. What about all of this uh, working with other guys and so forth? Did that go the way it was planned? Well, you never plan it, but, you know, you do whatever you can when you get out there. And, uh, you just see who can help you, and uh, what happens is, is when my car was real fast, a lot of guys wanted to go with me, so this Kodak car was tough today, and uh, you know, these guys had great pit stops, and I was just lucky enough to uh, bring her home.
With all the bad luck Davy Allison had experienced this season, Bobby Hillen Jr. as his relief driver turned out to be a bit of good luck. Hillen would go on to finish third, giving Allison, in a roundabout way, ranked number one among the big three for the seventh time. Elliott finished fifth, and Kawicki finished 25th. Because Allison started the race, he got all the points from Hillen's third place finish, which put him back in the lead over Elliott by one point, with Kawicki holding third. Watkins Glen and race number 18. Rain would be a factor all day and delay the start by several hours. This was the first race for Winston Cup cars since the new bus stop chicane was added in a lot of J.D. McDuffie's fatal accident in 1991. When the green flag finally fell, it was evident this would be a sprint to the halfway point. How about Dale Earnhardt? He put it on pole and would lead the first 10 laps. That's right, the Intimidator could turn right and left when he had to. Winston Cup race. Here they come out of turn number 11. Doyle Ford waves the green flag and we are finally underway. There are still a few wet spots on the track, but it should be okay as they head for you, Benny. Here coming down, Dale Earnhardt has the jump. Kyle Petty jumps in behind him and Ricky Rudd trying to get on the inside of Kyle. And meanwhile, there are about four abreast back there behind. Believe it or not, they made it through the corner. Three abreast. Daryl Walter, Jeff Bodine, and Bobby Hillen. And guess what? Okay. Davy Allison, still suffering from his Pocono injuries, would be relieved by Dorsey Schrader during the race. Kyle Petty and Ernie Irvin would swap the lead a couple of times with Petty finally coming out on top at lap 36. A caution would send the leaders to pit road with a couple of drivers staying on track, putting Dick Trickle in the lead. This caution was brought out when Derek Cope's car stalled up in turn number three. And we understand that, again, several positions around this 2.4-mile racetrack are reporting raindrops. Now, this is very important. Look at the Fram Field standings here as we're five laps away from the halfway point. And you know the race restarted on lap 44, one lap before the halfway point. Kyle Petty's going to make quick work, possibly, of Dick Trickle and take the lead here before they get into the first turn. Yeah, Kyle's got the lead already. Here comes the leader off of corner number 11, and cross flags are displayed. The halfway point has been reached, and Kyle Petty. And Bob, it's raining down here in turn one. Where you been, Eaton? I went on lunch break, but I'm back now, and it's raining. Well, the caution is out in this corner up here, Bob. I don't know if that's yep, going to be full overall. caution. Full, of course, caution apparently will be. They'll race hard back to that caution, Bob, because this might be their last chance. This could be the end of the race. You see the yellow flags being displayed by the corner workers, but it is waving also from the starter stand, indicating an overall caution. We're watching the battle I think for Mark Mark was waving like, hey, it's raining up here. And Ernie Irvin's like, to get the rain. He does I'm going for the pass. Now he's going to try to get second away from Morgan Shepard. Kyle Petty, meanwhile, is the leader of the race. He comes off of corner number 11 and takes the caution flag. Irvin trying desperately to get second, and he does not. Morgan Shepard second right now. Ernie Irvin, then Mark Martin and Wally Dallenbach as the cars hammer down for turn one, having taken the caution flag. Did Mark Martin have his hands full trying to get back by <laughs> Ernie Irvin? Boy, oh boy. After running under caution for several laps in the rain, NASCAR finally calls this race, giving Kyle Petty his first and only road course win. It was also Petty's first win of the season, along with Pontiac, who finally get on the board. Okay, what we're, what we're hearing right now, Kyle, is that you're the winner of the race. Congratulations. I'd take it and go to the house, but I got to go from a higher authority than you. <laughs> Hey, come on now. Are you guys sandbagging me or what? Oh, you don't believe us, huh, oh. Kyle? <laughs> Wait well, a second. We have... Watch the flag stand, Kyle. We have yeah, not... they got it. It's been confirmed, Kyle. Now, okay. now you got the higher authority. <laughs> I guess so, man. And I tell you, uh, you know, we run really good. But And, and I owe it all to Robin Pemberton and John Wilson, them guys. We had a great motor. If you could, if you saw it on TV and watched your car run up the backstretch, you saw how good it handled through the S's and how fast it was down the backstretch. All I had to do was keep it between the ditches the other times. So, you know, it was just, we were lucky today. And, uh, you know, I, I was praying the last, prayed before the race started, but I prayed the last 10 or 15 laps that we'd make it the halfway and be leading. And uh, I think the good Lord answered our prayers today. Among the big three, Kawiki wins the day 
and ranked number one for the fourth time with a seventh place finish. Elliott finished 14th, and Allison, having been relieved, finished 20th. This gave Elliott the point lead, 17 ahead of Allison, and 94 ahead of Kulwiki. Michigan and race number 19. Prior to the Sunday race, strategy struck the Allison family. During the Bush Grand National practice on Thursday, Davy's younger brother Clifford died as a result of a single car crash in turn three. Thank you, Bob. As if overcoming the pain of physical injury weren't enough, today Davy Allison must bear the emotional burden of a devastating loss. Four days ago, his younger brother Clifford lost his life in a practice accident here at Michigan. But for the next three hours, Davy must put aside the hurt and concentrate on the task at hand. Davy knows that's what Clifford would have wanted. If you are among those who are watching who believe that race drivers are not athletes, I challenge you to find another individual who must overcome the physical and emotional adversity that faces one Davy Allison today. Where does he get his strength? He told me it comes from the plaque that hangs over his office wall that he sees every day when he goes to work. And the plaque reads, there isn't anything that can happen today that me and the Lord can't handle. Lake Speed would bring out the caution on lap 88 with a spin, but the spin was the least of his issues. All year long. Oh, look here, boy, look at Lake Speed is the car that spun out, and he, he took the car on around the racetrack, but, boy, he has bigger problems now than he yeah. did when he spun out. This isn't a... Now, we got a lot going on in this clip. First, we got shirtless dudes cheering fire. Hey, that's what dudes do. Dudes do. Second, keep an eye on Biggin in the back of the truck. Replay, this is live. Man, oh, man, looks like an air line, uh, oil line is blown off or something. This would turn into another Michigan fuel mileage race when the final caution came out on lap 97 for a turn two accident involving Jimmy Hensley, Rick Mass, Jeff McClure, and Derek Cope. Mid-pack runner Harry Gant pitted while leaders Bill Elliott, Ernie Irvin, and Davey Allison stayed out, not believing they could finish the race on one more stop. And a crash coming off the second corner right behind them. Right behind what we were watching, a crash breaks out. Rick Mast is involved and several others. Still leading, not showing any sign of making a pit stop is Harry Gann in the skull bandit. Comes around the Eddie Beersworth car. Still isn't going to come in. That's lap 147. Bob, I have a report here that he stopped on lap 96. Okay, we're, he's now working the 148th lap, so that means that he has already run 52 laps. If he can go another lap, then he can go the rest of the distance. How about that? There's lap 198. No, 99. There's the white flag. The white flag is out, and Harry Gann has one more lap to go to victory. An unbelievable situation as we watch that battle there for a second. Now we focus our attention on the leader, Harry Gant, and it appears as if Harry is going to win his second race of 1992. Brent Ledine has run out of gas as he went by and got the white flag. I said when he made his pit stop, you know, it was a three-second pit stop. I said, I don't know if they got enough gas in that thing. Now, does that, that give me a little bit back for making that other big mistake? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> on the top of the racetrack in turn number four, coming down off the banking. He sees the checkered flag from Doyle Ford waiting, and there it is, Gant wins. This would be Harry Gant's last win in the Cup Series. Gant set a new record for oldest winner of a Cup race in 52 years and 219 days. It was also Oldsmobile's second victory of the season, and like Gant, their last in the Cup Series. Harry Gant climbs out of the car. He's congratulated by Andy Petrie, the chief. Harry, congratulations. 24th to first. It hasn't never been done here at uh, Michigan, but you did it today. Well, uh, you know, the car really ran good today. We kept coming in early and making adjustments. And uh, we knew it wasn't going to really hurt us a lot because there's a lot of cars we could beat, and we knew the ones we had to beat at the end. So uh, we kept adjusting. We finally get to Chester in real good shape. And the last time we pitted, Andy says, go a little further. I said, man, it's certainly adjusted in good now. He said, but go six more laps. Go all the way to the fuel pressure drops. And and we could make it. So that's what I did. And the last set of tires was the super best set I had all day. So I, I never really had to run. You know, he kept saying safe fuel and he kept calling out the sequence to everybody else. And uh, so uh, when we had it ready, we didn't have to run until we won it. <laughs> Among the big three, Elliot takes rank number one with a third place finish. Allison would come home fifth and Kawiki finished 14th. Elliot extended his points lead to 37 over Allison as Kawiki dropped to fourth 143 behind Elliott. 
Bristol in race number 20. This was the first race at Bristol after the track was resurfaced with concrete. Thank you very much, Bob, and hello, everyone. You know, it took a lot of courage and over three quarters of a million dollars for Bristol International Raceway promoter Larry Carrier to turn the world's fastest half-mile facility into a concrete arena. But after three paving jobs, which were not to his satisfaction, in fact, the pavement began to come apart, he said, I'm going to put concrete down. And many drivers believe that it's the wave of the future. 250 laps last night. The surface may be a little bit rough, but it didn't come apart. That's exactly what they wanted. Jerry, earlier this week, Davey Allison underwent a couple of surgical procedures on his wrist. They removed one of the pins. Davey, you've had a couple of days to practice here. Run some laps. Feel the vibrations. How does the wrist feel? Everything feels good right now, John. Uh, haven't had any, any problems in practice at all. We did let Bobby Hill and go ahead and make a few laps just in case we ran into a problem during the race, but the outlook right now is to go ahead and run all 500 laps. The new surface proved to be a bit treacherous for pole sitter and leader Ernie Irvin. Oh, and a crash. Ernie Irvin. Ernie Irvin has crashed. He has spun on the back stretch and made contact with the inside pit wall. Take a look and see what happened. Just coming off the second corner and around it goes. Ricky Rudd not within a car length or two of the Kodak film Chevrolet and he goes down and hits the wall pretty good with that right side. Now Irvin, or Irvine if you prefer, wasn't the only one having issues early with the new surface. Missed it. Sterling Marlin spins. He got it turned around and he too just comes off the second corner and without being touched or without any help at all, loses it and spins down the backstretch. Ricky Rudd leading this race. There we see, we're still watching Sterling Marlin as, oh, he is Dale Jr. Now that's two for Sterling so far in this race. Well, Jerry hit the wall. He didn't spin completely around. He kept going. Good enough for him. And a car into the wall. That's Dave Marcus in 41, the Kellogg's car. Now it has spin down in turn four. Morgan Shepard loops. I don't know whether this is going to cause a caution or not. Typically, the short tracks are the payback tracks. And if there was any ill will between Davey Allison and Darrell Waltrip, it didn't appear so, as Waltrip would pass Allison for the lead without any issue. A week from tomorrow, you need to write to the Gillette Halfway Challenge, Post Office Box 2246, St. Petersburg, 337-31-2246. You must be 18 years of age or older to enter, and we must have your entry by Saturday, September the 5th, to be eligible for the next day. Waltrip is the new leader. On lap 225, Davey Allison would lose control back in his car into the wall. Points leader spins up in three, backs in the wall. Here's Marlin also spinning. Some heavy yeah. contact to the rear of the... He's not the points leader, that's right, he's the second place car. Are you okay, Davey? Yeah, I'm fine, Jerry. The car, the car just got away from me down there going into turn three. It had been a little bit loose getting in the corner, but it wasn't bad, and then that lap, it, I guess I just locked the right rear wheel up. Now back in the wall, it's a tough break. These guys have been doing a great job. The car was running good, so hopefully we can get it fixed and get out there and get some points. The 2018 repaired the car, allowing Allison to rejoin the race for a few more laps. Surely. And, uh, well, David just oh, ran out of the way. Brent, no, Brent, I believe Brent Patrick was a little bit coming off that too. corner. Yep. Boy, Davey is just uh, having a terrible evening. Now he's shortened the car up on the front end. There they are coming off of turn four, and they come up on Davey. Davey tries to get out of the way. Well, I don't know. I don't know. It's hard to tell if he touched him or not. It was hard to tell. Maybe this angle will help. I, think, uh, I don't think so. I don't think he touched no, him. I, I think, with, think no, with a spoiler, no spoiler on the back of the car, I think when he turned it, the back end just came around. Here's one more angle. Let's see if we can see. No, I don't think, I don't think so. Don't believe it is. Nope. Nope. No contact. And a crash out of Oh, Harry Gant has crashed here on the main straightaway. Let's see. How about that? Yeah, Rusty's rest, rest going to race him back. Alan Kowicki would spin during this accident as well, but only received minor damage. And out in turn number two, Alan Kowicki and Mark Martin have spun. Now, this is uh, the incident here on the main straightaway involving Harry Gant. Watch uh, the back. It looks yeah, like whoop. he and was that Ernie Irvin down there? Kurt, no, Michael Walker. Mm -hmm. I believe the yellow car just got together a little bit. Now, while that was happening out in turn number two, this was going on between Colwicki and Martin. 
but Kyle, Kyle Betty, Betty just <laughs> barely got through. Man. I don't see too much damage to Kowicki's car. Darrell Waltrip would lead the final 133 laps to pick up his second win of the season. And for the winningest driver in Bristol history, this would be his 12th and final win at the popular track. White flag is out. He's on his final lap. Less than a half mile to go now. Looks like the crew is celebrating already. They know he's got a one. He can probably coast the rest of the way. Here's Waltrip off of corner number four. And the checkered flag waves. Daryl Waltrip has won the Bud 500 at Bristol. After Waltrip's Pocono win, Jeff Hammond would step down as crew chief. Waltrip stated, Jeff Hammond was with me for 43 wins, but our communication and chemistry wasn't there this season. We weren't running well in the early part of the season, and we simply had reached the point where we needed to separate or we were going to kill each other. Who replaced Hammond as crew chief? Legendary Jake Elder. Waltrip and Elder had worked together several times back in the 70s and during the 1980 season. Very, very happy crew right here. Jake Elder getting congratulations all around. Well, Jake, not a bad night for you, mechanic of the race. You also win the race. A good running car. It wasn't just fuel mileage tonight that won it for you guys. That's a good race tonight. I'm glad to see Daryl win, win a race like this. The whole crew, too. They done a good job. Everybody done a good job tonight. You guys apparently found something early on where he can work in that high groove. Was that the game plan going in here that you figured you'd get up there and run as well as you did? Well, yeah, we've been working on it all, all week up here. Uh, we can run high or low. It seems like he can run a little bit better high to get low. Yeah, you see the big smile on Jake Elder. We'll let you go to victory lane now. Honey, it's me again in victory lane with the, you know, for the kid, for Sarah, Caitlin, Kearns, Walter. One time. Drove my heart out, baby doll. Drove my heart out. For you. Now, now yes. wait. I'm close. For you. Look. Oh, he's not happy a bit. Oh, he's playing a little bit of little Gatorade. Let me ask you now. Wait a minute. You what, had what, what? you had Jessica. You won. Now you had Sarah, Caitlin, Kearns, Waltrip. You won. What does that mean uh, for Stevie at home? Well, there's more rewards to having kids than I thought there was. No, no. It's, it just means that uh, I get really pumped up. I feel good, and uh, Stevie's feeling good, and the baby's great. And, and, you know, I just come here with a good attitude. And I, I, my team... My team is so great, and they're doing a great job. Praise God for a good night, for a win. Oh, everything I could hope for. What a week. What a year. What a day. And he certainly is excited, and rightfully so. An excited new father and a winner here at Bristol International Raceway. And Daryl Walter picks up win number two for 1992. And it was the 83rd win. Of his Among the big three, despite some minor damage, Kawiki took rank number one for the fifth time with his fifth place finish. Elliott finished sixth, and Allison, after crashing out, finished 30th. Elliott extended the points lead to 109 over Allison as Kawiki moved back to third, 133 behind the leader. Darlington and race number 21. The attention largely focused on Davy Allison, who was eligible for the Winston Million, and could also claim a career Grand Slam by winning all four majors in his career. The Daytona 500, Winston 500, Coca-Cola 600, and the Southern 500. As I began working on this video, I came across this piece that ran prior to the Darlington race. I debated on whether or not to include it. I try to keep the mood of these videos light and fun, but I thought, maybe someone needs to hear this. Maybe I needed to hear it. Life deals us a set of cards. We have to go out and make the best out of it. One of the cards that we got dealt was the loss of Clifford at Michigan, but that's in the past now, and I know that he would want us to go on and, and work hard and work with the same enthusiasm, and that's what we're gonna do. And, you know, in a way, there's something missing, but what's missing is helping to fuel the fire that's burning right now. I've seen a lot of wrecks in this business. I've seen a lot of bad wrecks, and I've, I've seen some that weren't so bad looking as, as the wreck that I was in at Pocono. Some of the, the ones that weren't so bad looking, people didn't walk away from. And I don't recall many of them that looked worse than what I, our wreck looked or appeared that people did walk away from. So I, I got to thinking about that. And 
there was a message being sent to me. That there's a reason why I'm still here. And that's the part of me that's different. By looking back on it now, I think, yeah, maybe there was something being sent to me, you know, through the little wrecks at Daytona in practice, here in the race, Martinsville, Charlotte, Sears Point. You know, something was trying to tell me something along the way, and then in Pocono, just wake up, you know, open your ears, open your eyes. And, you know, I, I don't know what the future holds, but Whatever it is, I'm going to try my best to do it right. They're doing good. You know, they, they have had their ups and downs over the last couple of weeks, especially my mom has had some really tough times. And if I could send a message to any one person out there in this world, you know, that I probably haven't done enough, and well, not even probably, I know I haven't done it enough, that's to tell her, hi, thinking about you, I love you, and we're going to be there for you. I'd find it hard to, to sit here right now and say, yeah, that's the mission. Um, if somehow that could be turned into something that would be a positive influence on other people or several other people or whatever, if one good thing develops out of that for somebody else, then I'd say, yeah, maybe that was part of it. It's hard work, dedication, a great team that, that enjoys each other's company in the shop and outside the shop. And I think determination that is beyond any level I've ever seen. You are looking live at Davey Allison as he sits poised in his race car, hoping to do something that he has never done before, win at Darlington. If he does today, he'll capture the Winston Million given to the driver who can win three of four selected NASCAR Winston Cup races. And to get it back on the light side, as I said earlier, this was in the middle of a major election in 1992. So guess who was at this race? And in typical Clinton fashion, he gets a little handsy <laughs> trying to get after the microphone. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, start your engine. Hey, I feel your pain. I'm going to be leading the free world. Cloudy skies and rain were in the forecast. The race started on time and cruised well beyond the halfway point. Allison ran in the top three most of the day, leading the most laps. We continue to hear reports that rain is coming, but we have had none so far. Larry McReynolds, crew chief for Allison, was concerned about the impending rain, so he sent a crew member to the NASCAR hauler to look at the weather radar and help determine if he should stay out or pit. After checking the radar, crew member told McReynolds to pit the car. Allison would pit on lap 286, and just moments later, on lap 295. What are you going to do if you're Darrell Waltrip? You're going to stay out there and you run out of gas. <laughs> the yellow is out. The yellow is out because of rain. As it began to rain, McReynolds asked the crew member, I thought you said the radar looked good. The crew member said, yes, it did. It was all green. Green means good, to which McReynolds responded, green means rain. The red flag tells it all. The race has been stopped. The Southern 500 is under red because of rain on lap 298. He will try very gingerly to climb out of the cars. The rains really start to come down here, and he uh, banged that arm trying to get out, and now he will climb out as the fans now wave. And a young man who has shown a tremendous amount of courage here these past four weeks. Bob? Here's the radar. This dot right here is the Darlington uh, International Raceway. And you can see the green around that area, around the racetrack, is a little bit darker than the rest of the green. That means that it's raining pretty hard right here, which you know from standing outside. Look at D.W. sitting there. <laughs> I'm the, he said, I'm the smartest guy around here. <laughs> He's the leader right now under red. Is he sitting in the rain? Surely. Looks like it. Surely he's got sense enough to come in out of the rain. <laughs> he's, just, he's just sitting here relaxing in the uh, CW. Would you like some sunscreen? Ah, you know, I'd like to see what's going to happen here. I, I got a pretty tough skin. I may not need no sunscreen today. It is drizzling just a little bit. Well, you know. 
I hate to, I don't know what to expect here, you know. I mean, uh, we're leading the race and it's raining, that's good. How long it's gonna rain, we don't know, and so you gotta sit here with a little bit of a knot in your stomach and wonder, but while I'm sitting here, I am gonna enjoy myself. Jerry, get through uh, that hey. umbrella, let it get wet. Love you. All right, so uh, he, he wanted to, to sit here, so we're gonna walk away with the umbrella, hey, and uh, it don't matter if I get a cold or not. Don't worry about it, I'll be okay. Hey, you talk about a happy race driver. Let him lead, and he'll sit out here and let it just pour down rain. DW winning last week. Hey, the proud papa for the second time. Uh, his wife and two little girls sitting at home watching him, probably wondering why daddy's a little bit uh, different. And uh, <laughs> That's a good word. <laughs> what? I, I got a classic for you. What's that? I don't mean to be a smart aleck, and it might quit raining, and I hope it does so Davey might have a shot at the million. But somebody down there asked me how much gas I had left in my tank. It's about a million dollars worth. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to be a smart aleck, but that's about how much is left. <laughs> oh, I'm sure Davey does not want to hear that. I've got two amateur weathermen here with me, guys. Now, Daryl Walter says he thinks he hears it thundering. Clear there. I think a storm come. Bad storm. Look over here, man. It's getting dark. I can hear it clearing up. You hear it? I can hear them clouds leaving. <laughs> what? I think I'm going to go to my truck. This looks like it's getting serious. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. There's nine cars on the lead lap. We started back. Uh, at least one of them's out of gas. We know that, that Brett Bodine's low on fuel. Somebody else has been over here sweating a little. I can only run 11 more laps, and then I got to come in. <laughs> <laughs> I was just kidding him. I didn't tell him. To, I didn't want to tell him, man, because I didn't want to hurt. I didn't want to depress him. But, you know, I can go maybe 11 more laps. <laughs> Why'd your face turn so red when you said that? <laughs> let's go, to, hey, the truth let's go down to Western Auto and buy some Havilland motor oil. Won't you? <laughs> now, wait a minute. If it stops raining and they get it dried, it's going to be uh, getting close to dark. Well, you know it. As long as they it... got Q-beam spotlights at Western oh, Auto, too. As long as it keeps doing this, uh, I'm, I'm a happy camper. <laughs> Davey, uh, standing here awful calm, thinking about that million dollars. Ain't thinking about that million dollars, because right now, if this thing does end, we've got our first top five finish in the Southern 500, and we turn our record around. So we're pretty happy. We run our kind of race today and stayed out of trouble. I ain't running to Daryl or hitting nobody else. And <laughs> <laughs> ain't running to the wall yet. We're so just bragging about that. He hadn't run into anybody. I hadn't run into anybody. We've had a pretty neat day, and I've never won the Southern 500. This is his best finish. I mean, you know, I think that's enough to call it. <laughs> You talk, you talk about optimism. After the broadcast went off the air, they would call the race, give a Walter his second consecutive win, third for the season. More importantly, his first Southern 500 victory, making him the fourth driver to finish off the career Grand Slam. It was also Walter's 84th final cup victory, along with crew chief Jake Elder's 44th and final cup win. Now for the big three. By staying out for the rain, Elliott jumped Allison and takes the number one rank with a third place finish. Allison came home fifth and Kawiki eighth. Elliott's point lead increased to 119 over Allison and 161 over Kawiki. Richmond in race number 22. Rusty Wallace, one of the preseason favorites, had struggled all season. A crew chief change would see Buddy Parrott return to Penske Racing and take over the number two team. Dale Earnhardt will give his insight on the championship battle. Dale Earnhardt, if anybody here is an expert on those career season Winston Cup point battles, it's the five-time champion, Dale. He thinks this year's fight may go right down to the wire at Atlanta in November. There's nobody really dominated the uh, consistency. Davies had his problems with crashes and we blew up and Bill's had his problem being off on the chassis or whatever. And who knows how it's going to turn up. Allen's been about the most consistent car out there, him and uh, Harry Gant. So if they can keep that up and Bill and Davey keep uh, having little mis miscues or whatever, it could be anybody's race. The combination of Wallace and Parrott paid dividends early as Wallace led the final 139 laps and beat Mark Martin by 3.59 seconds for the win team in disarray earlier in the summer looking like they've got it back together once again with buddy Parrott. oh i can remember when he was a tire buster for goodyear was a great diver i'm not sure he's not straining more now than when he used to mount those tires watching this race that's part of the show it used to be after race to go down to the motel and watch him he, he was a clown diver for some circuit he was terrific doesn't do that anymore got his war face on out there tonight what a heck of a guy well, they turned this into a three-ring circus tonight <laughs> for their sale. Out to be a big slam. He's a 
pool of champagne in victory lane for Rusty Wallace. 1989 Winston Cup champions under a white flag. Getting ready to wrap it up. Checkers are down, and Rusty Wallace has finally done it. Rusty Wallace, fantastic run for you. It's been oh, some 40 man, races here to get his crew chief yeah. in here. Buddy Pear, Rusty, what about it? Well, the car handled perfect. Buddy made some great calls today. I mean, the car, everybody did their perfect job. Killer pit stops, motor ran great, car handled perfect. All I can say is that, you know, where I think we're back. I mean, Buddy's really leading the team good, and we're a lot of organization. Everything's clicking perfect right now. So I couldn't be happier, and this is the first race all year long that Roger Penske's been to, and he sit up there and cheered me on, and he got to see me win finally. So I loved it, and Pontiac, and uh, Goodyear, and all the guys, you know, deserved it. So Wallace wins his first race of the year and Pontiac picks up their second win of the season. Not a better day for the big three, as Elliott took rank number one with a 14th place finish, Kowicki finished 15th, while Allison spun twice and finished 19th. Elliott extended his points lead to 134 over Allison and 164 over Kowicki. Dover in race number 23. So odd to go back and watch these old races and see Asphalt Bristol or Asphalt Dover. Ellen Kowicki would take the pole, much to everyone's surprise. Worked harder this weekend than any other crew chief. You see, on Friday morning, he watched his driver lose control into the wall, destroying their primary race car. They had a backup car. Paul and crew got it out. It wasn't nearly ready to qualify. But in two hours, it was on pit road, last in line. And guess what? The driver, Alan Kowicki, put it on the pole. And Alan, I think you were more amazed than anybody else. Well, that crash didn't do anything to help my confidence out and uh, this is a tough track but you know the crew did a great job getting the other car ready and however the backup car would find trouble as well early in the race uh, trouble turn oh, three. Oh boy. one car collects the wall and it's Alan Kowicki ruining his second car of the weekend in a big way uh, he hit it a ton too when we saw him he was four points behind Bill Elliott for the Winston Cup point lead. Watch the seven car. There he is going on the end on the outside of Chad Little. They have contact Ooh. right there. Yeah, they touched a little bit. It's hard to say if Quickie was coming down, the nine's going up, but they did touch. Got him turned around backwards. And I'll tell you, they just get faster right here, buddy, when they start sliding. Wow, I'm telling you, that is a hard look, too. Look at that car get back up in that wall. It looked like a magnet. Still somewhat shaking. Alan Kowicki has come out of the care center now. Alan, are you okay? Yeah, I'm all right. Can you tell us what happened up there? Well, I was trying to lap the nine car, and he pulled over on the back stretch to let me go. I went in the third turn on the outside of him, and he hit me in the left rear and spun me around. We hit the wall really hard. And not a very good day for us. Probably pretty much ruins our championship over for this year, but we'll be back. Well, the crew is still working on the car. Do you feel up to getting back in it if they can repair it? It's hard at that thing hit. They're probably just working on it to load it on the truck. I doubt if we'll be back today, but we'll be back another day. We're not going to give up. In the long and well-documented rivalry between Dale Earnhardt and Jeff Bodine, it would seem Bodine came out on the short end of many of these on-track clashes. Oh, man, here we go. And here comes the whole field. Jeff Bodine got that thing down to the inside of the racetrack and... Okay, here they come up out of the corner. It looks like Bodine's car might have just jumped out just a little bit right there. Here comes Earnhardt up under him. There's your contact. I tell you, it don't take much. Just a, just a brush and there he goes sideways. That's a shame for Bud Moore and those guys because that car was running really well. Bill Elliott dominated the majority of the race, but pit stop strategy would factor into the outcome. And Elliott's chances for the Winston Cup. He is the leader by 134 coming in here today, and he leads Ricky Rudd by 3.2 seconds. 55 laps to go, including one pit stop. Moments ago, Bill Elliott brought the Budweiser Ford of Junior Johnson into the pit, and as you'll see here, took on four tires and fuel. And here comes Russ. What do you think, buddy? Will he draw tires or will he stand pat? We're going to see if they're good poker players. We're going to see. 
Are they going to try to outrun him or how strategy? I can't help but think you'd have to go. You'd have to get him on go with gas only. He doesn't need but a couple of gallons. Put some gas in there and send him on the way. But they, they had the luxury of seeing the four car lose. I mean, put four tires on. And it is fuel only. Three second stop for Ricky Rudd. Elliott coming as hard as he can. If Rudd doesn't slip or have a problem, it looks like he's going to be able to hold Bill off, but he's going to really reel him in this last lap. Linda Rudd hasn't been to victory lane since April of 1991 with her husband. And this is the last lap. Everybody's on their feet. A lot of traffic right in front of them. Back straight away. Elliott, so close he can taste the win, and he hasn't won since the fifth race of this season. Fourth turn, checkered flag. Ricky Rudd wins the peak and a freeze 500. Rudd held on to beat Elliott to the finish line by .5 seconds, his only victory of the season, and extending his streak of consecutive seasons with at least one victory to 10. This was the eighth win of the season for Chevrolet. The insurmountable lead Ford had earned this season had now shrunk to three. Well, we, <laughs> we well, I think we stole it. I, you know, Bill had the car at the end, but you know, we'll take it any way we can get it. This, uh, these, the guys in the pits won this thing. That uh, they put their heads together, made a daggum good call, and that's what won it for us. Among the big three, Elliott takes rank number one for the eleventh time of the season, following a second place finish. Allison was fourth and Kawiki crashed out at 34th. Elliott extended his points lead over Allison to 154 points, the highest margin of the season. Harry Gant jumped to third, moving Kawiki to fourth and leaving him 278 points out of the lead with six races left. Martinsville in race number 24. Rain would push this race to Monday. Dale Earnhardt would finish in last place for the third time this season. Apparently the bolt that holds the harmonic balancer in the front of the engine, the crank on has broken. When that bolt broke and the harmonic balancer broke, it cut one of the fan belts which came off, which meant he lost oil pressure. Bill Elliott would also suffer an engine failure on lap 161. Car blew up. Bill Elliott, big puff of smoke down the straightaway. He Interesting comment. That's the big puff of smoke. He said the champion in NASCAR Winston Cup competition will be the driver who has the least amount of bad luck, and bad luck has certainly struck Bill Elliott today. Here Jeff O'Don would lead the final 43 laps, holding off Rusty Wallace to pick up his first win of the season. Here's the white flag being waved for Jeff Bodine. One more lap to go. Rusty Wallace falls now about five car lengths behind Jeff, and it appears as if he's not gonna be able to mount a challenge. And Jeff Bodine is going to win his 12th career NASCAR Winston Cup victory and become a four-time winner at Martinsville. Here's the checkered flag. Jeff Bodine wins the Goody 500. Jeff, congratulations on an outstanding effort. I tell you, I feel like I, I run a thousand miles today. One more. I wish you'd been here. I'm about to pass out. That was a tough race at the end, bud. Finally got one igloo photograph for uh, we told everybody this thing was going to turn around. It did at Dover. And, uh, hey, we're here. Kowicki emerged as the best finisher among the big three, taking rank number one for the sixth time following a fifth-place finish. Allison had trouble all day, finishing four laps down in 16th, and Elliott's blown engine left him in 30th. With Elliott's bad day, his points lead shrunk to 112 over Allison. Kowicki jumped back to third, 191 points behind the leader, Bill Elliott. North Wilkesboro in race number 25. Second straight race that was pushed to Monday due to rain. The usual one at that for a short track considering it went caution free. This would be the last time that a NASCAR short track race went flag to flag green and unless NASCAR removed stage racing caution flags introduced in 2017, we'll never ever see a short track race go caution free again. And those cars warm, and it will take at least five laps to do that because these cars have not moved since. Is that what they morning. call jazz There's hands? Jimmy Cox telling all the drivers. Oh, oh David, what are you doing? <laughs> Davey Allison took a swipe at him, a friendly swipe. So did Schrader. Alan Kowicki was on pole and would lead the first 34 laps.
Jeff Bodine would emerge as the dominant car, leading 312 of 400 laps. Interesting. There is one more lap to go for Jeff Bodine, who finished fourth here at North Wilkesboro in the spring. He won Martinsville last week after a rain delay, and he has won here at North Wilkesboro after a rain delay. Jeff Bodine from Chemung, New York, picks up career win number 13. Bodine recorded his second consecutive win, and only two cars finished on the lead lap. Bodine lapped everyone except runner-up Mark Martin. He would lap points leader Bill Elliott eight times under green. This was Ford's 13th win of the season, clinching their first manufacturer's championship since 1969. It was also the first time a brand other than General Motors won the manufacturer's title, Dodge, in 1975. Jeff Bodine last week was impressive. Today, man, you were hooked up. Kathy, you should be here. Maybe you're here. I don't know, but I don't think so. Kathy bowls on Monday mornings, but I love you, Matt, Barry. Hey, two in a row. This car was great. This was a lot of fun. It was fun last week, but uh, a little harder than today. This car was hooked up. Allison's 11th place finish gave him rank number one among the big three for the eighth time. Kawiki followed in 12th, and Elliott finished 26th. Allison and Kawiki both gained ground on Elliott in the points battle, with Allison only 67 back and Kawiki 144. We direct your attention to the infield standing next to the most famous car in motorsports, the president of the Charlotte Motor Speedway, H.J. Humpy Wheeler. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure all of you are aware that the driver of this most famous car is about to race for the last time in the same community where he won his very first race 32 years ago. I want each and every one of you to join us in singing Auld Lang Syne to our friend, the King, Richard Petty. By Diamond Rio. <laughs> I think old Humpy forgot that Diamond Rio was there. Old acquaintance be forgot and never brought to mind. Should old acquaintance be forgot and days of old anxiety. For old anxiety, my dear. surprised this many people know the words to that song. We love you, Richard. Happy New Year, King. Oh, wait. They, they just don't sing that song on New Year's Eve? My bad. Charlotte and race number 26. Alan Kowicki was on pole and would lead the first 39 laps. Ladies and gentlemen, we're underway with the Mellow Yellow 500. <laughs> Kyle Petty's remarkable run in the second half of the season will continue as he battled with Alan Kowicki, Mark Martin, for the lead during the middle part of the race. And here comes Kyle Petty in the Felix Savetas, car number 42, the Mellow Yellow car, down on the inside. What a charge. What a charge Kyle Petty has made. He was 21st in the points back in April at Martinsville, and he just keeps on trucking. He's up to six in the points as we get down toward the end of the season. For the third consecutive race, Points leader Bill Elliott will struggle, this time with a broken sway bar. Looks like somebody is slowing down dramatically. It's number 11 coming out of turn number four in big trouble. 
Bill Elliott, the Junior Johnson Budweiser car. However, team owner Junior Johnson, knowing how critical every point was, had entered a third car driven by Hutt Strickland for this race. Once they realized Elliott would lose several laps repairing the sway bar, Hutt Strickland retired his car, allowing Elliott to get back on the track and gain one position and three points. They went out and got themselves a welder. They're working on it now. They're going to have to weld the pieces back on and hope they're going to stay. A lot of laps been lost already for Bill Elliott. Six minutes and 32 seconds on pit road for Elliott. That little blue deal sitting there is a welding machine. They got to repair it. Uh, they usually make you take the car behind pit wall to do that yeah, much work on it. Yeah, what's the story? I was thought you couldn't use jack stands out on pit road. They've got them out there, and they're welding the rear and housing up on the car. You see the sparks and the fire fall in there. One of the guys is re-welding that bracket for <laughs> Yeah, sparks and fire on pit road. That's that can't be safe. Ken people would say, why is he doing this? But right now, he's completed 301 laps. Hutt Strickland's completed 305, and he fell out a few laps ago. Bill runs four more laps. He moves up another position. A gearbox issue for Kawiki would leave him with only fourth gear as he battled Mark Martin in the closing stages of the race, with Martin coming out on top, leading the final 32 laps and route to a second win of the season. Mark Martin is going to put this one away for Jack Roush Racing. Mark Martin seems to be on his way right now to his second 1992 Winston Cup win, the first one at Martinsville. Only three DNFs on that team this year. Three did not finish his. What a run he is having. Qualified fourth for today's race. Has run up in front. He's averaging 153 miles an hour a tear lately but mark you had the team a little antsy in there i know you must have been antsy in the car well you know i mean we just hadn't had any luck to win any races this valvoline car has been it's been this good for the last six races but we just hadn't won i'm just I'm kawiki takes rank number one among the big three for the second place finish allison will go several laps down to a flat tire and finish 19th elliott's sway bar issue left him in 30th after race number 23 at dover Elliott left with a 154-point lead over Allison and 278 over Kowicki. Since then, Elliott had finished 30th, 26th, and 30th, the worst stretch of the season for the number 11 team. His points lead now shrunk to 39 over Allison and 47 over Kowicki. Just a month ago, I was saying there were two guys with a chance to win the championship, Bill Elliott and Davey Allison. Boy, have things changed. Alan Kowicki has shown a lot of consistency, and he's worked his way right to the top. He's right there with him. And Mark Martin, just two weeks ago at Charlotte, pulled off a big win. Not only a win, but it put him right back in the points battle. Harry Gant, he's right there with him. Mr. Consistency. He's always running at the end of the race and always up front. Kyle Petty, he's probably had the best card the last 10 races, and now he's right back in the hunt. And we're sitting at his best racetrack right here at Rockingham. Rockingham and race number 27. Remember earlier in the season, race number three, the almost stinker at Richmond? Bill Elliott led 348 at 400 laps, but a late charge by Alan Kowicki took a little of the stink off the stunk. No such luck in this race. Kyle Petty stunk up the show, leading all but eight of the 492 laps. This would be Petty's second win of the season, third for Pontiac, and the only time Petty won multiple races in the season. Kyle Petty has this one in hand, looking for his sixth career victory, his fourth on a super speedway, and his third win from the pole, Kyle Petty. Total domination. Total domination. I tell you what, you know, we came down here the last couple of races, we've come down here and we've sat on a pole, but we've been way off in the race. But I tell you what, John Wilson builds the greatest motors in Winston Cup racing, and Robin Pemberton knows how to make the calls and knows how to set it up. And we might not have won the pit crew race, but by God, they won it out there on pit road today. Among the big three, Elliott rebounded after three consecutive poor finishes with a fourth-place finish, giving him rank number one for the 12th time. Allison finished 10th, and Kawiki finished 12th. Outside of the big three, six drivers entered Rockingham in contention for the championship. After the race, those six still remained, with Elliott holding the point lead by 70 over Allison, by 85 over Kawiki, by 94 over Petty, by 113 over Gant, and by 178 over Martin. Phoenix in race number 28. The Kings penultimate race. I just want to work penultimate in because I have such a hard time saying that word. Penultimate. I think that's right. Pre-race involving the king of stock car racing. Let's go down to Randy Pemberton. First of all, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce track announcer Ted Brown. Ted, 
Thank you very much. We Come on, Ted. We'd like to turn the microphone over now to the vice president of A&I Distributors in Billings, Montana, Mr. Gerald Stevenson, for today's Pyroyal 500 starting command. Thank you, Ted. Uh, and on behalf of Pyroyal and Valvoline, we'd like to welcome everyone here today. And we're looking forward to a fantastic okay, race. Come on, get and to with it. us today to give the command. How many command people are we going to talk to before we get the command? The let's, let's go. Come on, guys. Richard, give us the command. Gentlemen, start your engine. There you go. Much better than Daytona 500. There's Tim Brewer and part of the Budweiser crew. I'm sure they're trying to figure what to do to make that 11 car better for this points battle. During the race, Bill Elliott's car began to push water. But before we get into that, Let's review the history between crew chief Tim Brewer and owner Junior Johnson. Brewer began working with Junior Johnson back in the 70s and won a championship with Kill Yarborough in 1978 and Darrell Waltrip in 1981. Then there was a bit of a falling out. Brewer left Junior Johnson after 1981 but returned in 1985. So they'd been up and down the road a few times before 1992. However, despite the success, they always had a bit of a contentious relationship. Never more so than in 1992. Well, I'm into Budweiser pits right now, and uh, I see the water coming out of the right rear of Bill's car as he exits turn two. Now, Brewer, Tim Brewer says that it's only a little bit of overflow water, but for that thing to be pushing water out the overflow that much, it's got to be running hot. I also saw Junior Johnson back here adjusting and getting ready to pressurize the water container. They got a problem. They just don't want to admit to it yet, but I can see the water coming out of the car. A story from Brewer that sort of illustrates their relationship in 1992. It was no secret that Tim Brewer worked hard and played hard. <laughs> At one point, Johnson told Brewer he thought the team was partying too much and they were going to drink away the championship. Brewer stated, okay, we'll cut it out. And by cut it out, Brewer meant for the rest of the season, they only drank beer. <laughs> Look over on the right rear of the car. There you go, sir. That thing belching a little bit of water out of that right rear. Junior, looks like a little water coming out of the car. What's the problem? Well, we don't know. They, they put an awful lot of quick crowd on the racetrack a while ago. And we don't know if a lot of that's got in the radiator or what it is, but it looks like it's, it went from 190 degrees to 115. That's where it stopped. We don't know this is like a water again. We think maybe the radiator might have a lot of drag, you know, uh, quick draw off the racetrack in it right now. Well, I think he meant to 215 degrees, and that's getting awful hot. That's getting tested. As a car owner, Junior Johnson's going for his seventh title. Teddy Enterprises is one right now. You see them spraying water through the, the grill and into the cooling system. Junior's boy, look at the thing. It's cut a cylinder down. You know, it must have ran so hard it blew a head gasket or something. But we saw Junior spraying water. The cracked cylinder on the number 11 car would take Bill Elliott out of contention. Now let's get back to the contentious relationship between Junior Johnson and Tim Brewer. This information came from Brewer during an interview on the Sing Vault podcast. Great show. Check them out if you haven't already done so. Going into the Phoenix race, for whatever reason, both Tim Brewer and Junior Johnson were unsure about the particular engine they were going to run. Brewer stated he wanted to change out the engine, but any time he presented this type of discussion to Junior, it became an ordeal. According to Brewer, Junior could be quite unreasonable when it came to his motors. So not wanting to deal with the hassle, Brewer opted to say nothing. Junior was also thinking they needed to run a different engine. But at this point of the season, he didn't want to deal with the hassle of discussing it with Brewer. So the communication going into race number 28 between owner and crew chief for the number 11 team was at a minimum. Neither said anything, but in hindsight, not changing the engine probably cost them a championship. Davey Allison would take his first lead on lap 283 and lead the final 30 laps en route to his second consecutive Phoenix win and his fifth of the season. Also, his first win since the Pocono accident. The best. No. White flag for Davey Allison. That was check and check made right quick. <laughs> Allison one lap away from his fifth waste of cup win, the most by any driver this season. Fifth this season. Here it is, fourth place. Walter's going to run off for third by himself. Sterling Marlin, Bill Elliott's stablemate, trying to deny Alan Kowicki five points right here at the finish. And they're coming up on the left car. Out of turn four, Davey Allison will win it. Marlin. Well, Clint, 
in, we just had to run a patient race, you know, and, and try to stay out of trouble. We got in a couple of tight spots, and I just backed off and let everybody go. And, you know, Rusty was tough there in the middle portion of the race. I just sort of hung in there behind him and followed where he was going. And uh, then Mark caught a tough break at the end of the race, you know. And one thing about it, luck plays a big part of this game, and today was our lucky day. And I, I just got to say thanks to Larry McReynolds and Robert Yates for sticking behind me through the tough times. You know, I just can't believe it. Among the big three, Allison takes rank number one for the ninth time. Kawiki ran well, finishing fourth, and Elliott's engine issues left him in 31st. The win vaulted Allison back into the point lead, but now over second place Kawiki by 30 points. Elliott dropped from first to third, 40 points behind Allison. We still had three others in contention as well, and fourth was Harry Gant trailing by 97 points, Kyle Petty in fifth trailing by 98 points, and Mark Martin in six, just 113 behind leader Allison. It was the first time in the sports history that six drivers were still in contention heading into the final race. Atlanta and race number 29, final race of the season. Also the final race for the King and the first of 797 consecutive starts for Jeff Gordon. Never seen an atmosphere more electric, more emotion in the air. Richard Petty, last October, a year ago, you announced the Fan Appreciation Tour. Your chance to give something back, but they turned the tables on you. They wanted to say thank you to you. Now, on behalf of us at ESPN and the millions of fans around the world who didn't get a chance, thank you for all the memories. Well, we thank everybody. It's just been a great, great year. Uh, our race has not been too good, but everything else has been great, and we couldn't have been better from the fans' uh, part of it uh, you know I started out to say thank you fans fans come back and said thank you Richard and I've enjoyed all 35 years of it hope they have the whole season has been an emotional roller coaster for Davey Allison a lot of people say for what he's been through he deserves to win this championship and hard work and perseverance have paid off Davey you are in the lead heading in here to the last race how you holding up buddy I'll tell you John right now I'm just incredibly nervous I don't think I've ever been this nervous in my life but we're we're excited, a lot of anticipation going around right now. A lot of hard work by this team has paid off to get us to where we are, but we want to earn this championship today. Forget Apache cameras on drones, let's use some Apaches. And begin to chase the field as it goes around this one and a half mile oval. I expect the race cars to win this race. <laughs> <laughs> it is quite a spectacle though, to see all of this pre-race activity and to end the season on this tremendous note. It's been a great season, but to think that we have six drivers eligible to win the championship depending upon... <laughs> Good grief. I just like to look in your rearview mirror and see an Apache coming at you. Look at the altitude that this helicopter is... <laughs> what do you mean altitude? <laughs> There's hardly any altitude at all, is there? Exactly. He's not more than uh, 25 feet off the ground down the back stretch, now moving up a little bit to clear the grandstands as they fly by us. New idea for Humpy Wheeler, racing cars and Apaches at the same time. The green flag waves and the Hooters 500 is underway. Things started off with a bang between post sitter Rick Mast and Brett Bodine on just lap two. He's still out of the lap. Brett Bodine. Brett Bodine would not let Rick let. Oh, and we have a spin. Bodine is in the fence. So is Rick Mast. Let's oh, no. David got through. Kyle Petty got through. I think I saw Alan Kowicki on the bottom of the racetrack getting through. There are four or five cars that are heavily damaged. The caution flag is Bill Elliott got through. Then the race is back so to the Kowicki. line. The race is back to the line trying to lead a lap. Here they come. Mark Martin trying desperately to lead a lap and get five bonus points. But they are not going to what happened Bodine was in the lead as they crossed the stripe but Rick Mast was right there on the outside and then Brett's car got out from under him got out from under him Rick Mast spins and we see all the cars going by on the inside and Mark Martin what a great job he's doing saving that automobile Kawiki turned the car left now here comes who is that yellow car is that 41 I believe it is yeah. that Hud Strickland in the Hutt Kellogg's Hutt. Cornflakes car 
So initially, we thought all the championship containers got through clean, but turns out Davy Allison actually picked up some damage. Guys, a lot of concern down here in Davy Allison's pit. Now, Larry McReynolds behind me has been talking to Davy. Let me try to grab Joey Knuckles quickly. Joey, the concern is the damage on the left rear. What would that produce due to the car here early in the race? Well, Jimmy Spencer pulled up there and uh, told us that uh, there's, it's not going to rub. What we're concerned with is air uh, getting up inside the trunk. The way it's pulled out, it's pulled apart from our crush panel. So that's going to kind of act like a, a parachute. Once again, here is a replay. And there's Davey Allison. There's 41 car right behind him, Hud Strickland. Ooh, and Davey backs off, Hud goes in, hits him in the rear. And that shot Hud down into the uh, 26 car. Exactly. And for the championship contenders update, this is around lap 25. Three car battle up front in the Hooters 500 at Atlanta Motor Speedway. The finale of the 92 NASCAR Winston Cup season. Urban, Dale Earnhardt, and Jeff Bodine are first, second, and third. The leader in the race, Davey Allison, is back in 11th position. And if points were awarded right now, Allison would emerge as the champion by 20 over Elliott. As Elliott is now running in sixth, Kowicki ninth, Kyle 13th, Gant 24th, and Mark Martin 22nd, but Mark Martin is on the move. Dale Earnhardt, Ernie Irvin, Jeff Bodine, Rusty Wallace, and Bill Elliott as 44 of 328 laps have been completed. Points as of now, look how close it is. Four separating Allison and Kowicki. Elliott is third in the points if they were to be awarded right now, but we've got a long way to go. Dale Earnhardt leading and fitting for his 1992 season begins to have issues. Jerry Punch has a comment on Dale Earnhardt. Guys, Richard Childress just told me a minute ago that Earnhardt radioed the crew that he thinks he may have broken a valve spring. The car is beginning to flutter a little bit, not running as strong as it was early on. He's awfully, running awfully well, but the car is starting to flutter a little more. They won't know when they make their first pit stop, which should be in about six or seven laps. Earnhardt has run out of fuel. He radioed the crew just a moment ago, said the fuel pressure gauge has fluctuated. Guys, I got to come in now. And Rusty Wallace is pushing him, trying to get him an assistance down pit road. They are running very, very slowly, and Earnhardt is totally out of fuel. The car number three is not running. He is coasting down pit road. Richard Childress and the crew standing here with a bottle of ether to try to get the car refired. And now it quietly, can you believe the luck that Dale Earnhardt has had in 1992? Lap 64, let's interject a little more chaos. Three cars fighting for the lead. Earnhardt, he's run out of gas. Jeff O'Don and Ernie Irvin are on pit road. That's when Michael Waltrip spins, bringing out the caution. Several drivers, including Bill Elliott, had not pitted, so he inherits the lead. We also discover that Alan Kowicki is having issues with his transmission. We should be seeing caution here at Atlanta. We do see caution. Doyle Ford is waving the caution flag because of Michael Waltrip's spin. But boy, these points leaders, did they get... Bill Elliott, Davey Allison, Alan Kowicki had not made their pit stops. These fellas have got several of, of good cars a lap down now. Man, Elliott is leading the race. That's five bonus points. That helps him close the gap. Trying to win his second Winston Cup championship. There he is, Bill Elliott leading the race. Second is Alan Kowicki. Back at Atlanta Motor Speedway, and we are getting set to go green, but boy, the field looks pretty ragged, doesn't it? Yeah, They're it not going to start them. They're no, not no, going to no, start no. them. No, they can't start them this way. See what happened. There were some of those drivers that had made pit stops under the green. They did not come in now. Bill Elliott is the leader of the race, but there's about four or five cars in front of him that technically are in the lead lap. Elliott was trying to pull up on the outside. He can't do that. He's got a lineup behind those drivers who are... I like when you got that one fan... Who's going to get them lined up correctly? Are still in the lead lap in front of him. See, is Who do you think he's pointing at? Earnhardt? I mean, this is Georgia. Is he saying, Ironhead, get out of the way. Elliot's trying to win a championship. Kowicki have a problem, Jerry. Bob, let's find out. We heard Alan having trouble leaving pit road. Danny Glad, is there a problem in the transmission? 
Yeah, Jerry, the, the problem we run into is on these bigger racetracks where we have to run a taller rear end ratio. Uh, we have to run a lower first gear to get the car moving, and it's a brittle gear. They make a real expensive gear just for the application. We run it, but it's just a very brittle, it's, it's hard on it. And we tore first gear out of transmission. We'll have to leave the pit road on, in second gear. The points as of this moment. Allison is in sixth position, but still maintains the points lead. Kowicki is second, only 10 behind, and Bill Elliott is the leader of the race, and Elliott Kowicki right now tied. We got a restart on lap 72. A lot of cars on the tail end elite lap in front of leader Bill Elliott. But remember this lap, one lap, Kowicki was able to get past Elliott for the lead. You wouldn't believe the guy running about 10th is leading the race, but that's what's happening. Bill Elliott is the leader, and all these cars in front of Elliott laps down, trying to stay on the tail of the lead lap, and hope the caution plate comes out so they can get that lap back. And once again, gas has played into Bill Elliott's hands. Remember in the spring? He did not have the best car here, but he won the race because he stretched the fuel stop and caught all the other guys in the pits and a lap down. Admittedly, Bill Elliott had about a seventh or eighth place finish car, but he played it very smart. He and the Junior Johnson team, they stood out as long as they could, caught the yellow that they needed. That allowed Bill Elliott to win one of his four races in the early part of the 92 season. Meanwhile, as we watch this, Ernie Irvin has driven by Dale Earnhardt. Remember how they led the race earlier on? Here now, here is Alan Kowicki going to the inside of Bill, and this is the battle for the lead. And I believe Alan Kowicki would get five bonus points for leading that lap. He was slightly ahead of Bill when they crossed the line. So we had a three-wide battle for the lead among the championship contenders, with Mark Martin eventually coming out on top. The caution would follow shortly after on lap 85, and during the pit stops, Allison comes out first, giving him the lead. So thus far, we've had Elliott, Kowicki, Martin, now Allison, all championship contenders, having led at least one lap and awarded five bonus points. On lap 95, a crash involving six cars, and one of those being Richard Petty. Oh, a crash! Down the front straightaway. Ken Schrader, Wally Dollar back, Darrell Walters involved. And Richard Petty is flaming going into turn number one. He's knocked the oil cooler off his car, and the oil is on fire. Richard Petty, the car is on fire. Petty has got the car stopped. It'll be it'll extinguisher. You tell him, King. I mean, come on. It's my final race. Can you show a little bit of hustle putting this fire out that surrounded me? Fire. It's hot. It burns. Now, here's the crash. That's Trickle. Ooh, Look at that, Dolan back it bumped around. And there's Richard Petty going in and hitting Daryl Waltrip. Looks like the rest of these cars are able to slow down without too much trouble. And Richard driving down to the fire truck, like he said. Well, I don't know whether or not the drivers know, but you fans at home sure know because we keep you updated as to the points as of right now. Allison on top by 15. He's sixth in the race. Kowicki is third. Then Elliott, Martin, Gant, and Kyle Petty, who's having the worst race among those. Kyle Petty is in 18th position. So Mark Martin will be the first among the championship contenders to drop out of the race with an engine issue. And Mark Martin is slowing here on the main straightaway. Mark's Valvoline Ford is off the pace dramatically. Mark Martin's car is behind the wall. Harry Gant, another championship contender, will go down a lap, fade out of contention during the second half of the race. And there is Harry Gant, who is 12th and the last car on the lead lap as Bill Elliott tries now to lap him, making it just 11 cars on the lead lap. Well, he closed right up on the back of Harry Gant, and here he goes on the outside of Harry, puts him a lap down. So they've changed all four tires now. Let's see. Keeping you updated on the point situation all race long. If they were awarded right now, Allison would have a th two point two. victory. <laughs> and Elliott and Kowicki would be tied, tied for two a second. points behind. <laughs> wow, you can't get much closer than this. Here's Jerry Fallon. Going into this race, Allison only needed to finish sixth to win the championship. On lap 254, 
He was running in that position. Using the best time to do it. But for the last three years here, he has earned more oh, points. Oh, oh, look out. Davey Allison is in the crash, Bob. Uh oh, Ernie Irvin, and it's all over for Davey Allison. No, it's not over yet. I don't think he hit him that hard, maybe. Well, he hit pretty well, I think. He's got a lot of damage to the right side of the car. Ernie Irvin spinning, coming off of corner number four. Davey has got his car moving. Yeah, he's trying to pull away. But he can't but stare it. But it won't turn. It won't turn. The right front will not work. There Ernie goes up high. We see the four car, and all of a sudden the car just goes around. He loses control. When he saves it, he comes back right in front of Davey Allison. I think that was the only two cars involved in the crash. And only for the second time since 1979 will the points leader going into this final race not win the Winston Cup championship. Man, I'll tell you, what a way to end the championship hunt. Well, John, you know, that's just the way it goes sometimes. We had had some troubles, and we're trying to work our way back up there, just trying to run a smart race, and uh, ran over something in turn three earlier in the race, and we had to, to come in and repair the car from that. We caught a lucky caution flag, and I thought, all right, we're going to be okay now. And then I saw Ernie get loose over there in four, and you know we just ran out of room. You know I hate it. I hate it for all of them guys in the in the garage area. Everybody at Robert Yates Racing deserves a lot better than this. And, you know they deserve to win that championship this year, and we didn't get it. So we'll just go back and we'll get ready for next year, and we'll come out and try again. It just wasn't meant to be. Company and Davey Allison goes back out onto the racetrack. Doesn't look much like a NASCAR stock car. That looks like a modified. Kowicki would push his fuel to the limit in order to stay out and lead as long as possible to ensure he led the most laps in the race. Too much. Jerry, what are they thinking now? They told out in the pit that time by. Their calculations are it may not make it back. They said, you've got to come in as he very high in turn four. He must have just heard him, but he was already past pit entrance. So now he will come around and come in this lap. And he let Bill go by, and yep. now we'll watch for Alan Kowicki to make it down pit road, and how long it will take him to get gas only and be able to get back on the racetrack. Drama playing out here in the final laps at Atlanta Motor Speedway. Now, pressure was on the Kowicki pit crew. Not only do they have to get just a certain amount of fuel in it, he had no first gear, so they had to push him off. But there is still a little more drama. Less than four seconds for fuel. Derek Cope was right behind him for a pit stop. Ned, could he have gotten enough fuel in that know. car in three and a half seconds? Well, I wonder about that, Jerry. Look at that can. Did he get enough of it in there? I tell you, the can still looks awfully heavy. And you got to wonder, they're going to bring the can over and weigh it. That's how you determine how much fuel they got in that can. And you've got to wonder, boy, wouldn't that be something to lo lose it on about a second and a half fuel stop? They just put the can back up. They probably don't even want to know. <laughs> Now, there's not much they can do about it now. If they didn't get enough and he doesn't make it, that's it. The leader of the race is now Bill Elliott. Here comes Bill. And here comes Elliott. Elliott drops down off the banking. Here he comes, Jerry. Bill Elliott heads down pit road in the Budweiser for Thunderbird. This could decide the Winston Cup championship. Kyle Petty's smoking Pontiac leaves a trail of smoke, and Elliott must drive through here on pit road. During these final guess and go pit stops, championship contender Kyle Petty would begin having engine issues and drop out several laps later. So out of the six contenders, only Alan Kowicki and Bill Elliott were left on the lead lap. Who got enough fuel in to finish the race? Both with identical pit stops. Elliott goes back out onto the racetrack. Here comes Alan Kowicki through turn number one. Can Elliott get up to speed and get the lead? Yes, he will. He will have the lead when it's all boils down. So far, Terry Labonte has not made a pit stop. He's still the leader. And once again, we're keeping track of laps led. So that's one more lap that was lost to Terry Labonte, who would pit right after Bill Elliott. So Bill Elliott's going to lead 16 more laps. Uh -oh. Terry Labonte's going to lead these laps. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So Bill Elliott, if it finishes this way, he can't win the championship. Well, regardless uh, of Labonte leading those laps, Kowicki has led the most laps. Not officially, Not officially yet. All right. We'll wait. <laughs> Boy, this thing is going to go down to the bitter end. Bill Elliott leads the Hooters 500 with nine laps to go.
Well, that's speculation we did on Terry Labonte. He came in while we were away on the break for fuel, so that all went out the window. He was not going the rest of the way or couldn't. So Bill Elliott is the leader of the race. Alan Kawicki is running second. He's the leader of the Winston Cup. We're watching Alan Kowicki. He is not leading the race. He is second, but he is in the lead as far as the Winston Cup point standings are concerned. Bill Elliott is the leader of the race. And Jerry? The crew has just told Alan Kowicki that if Bill leads the rest of the laps, that Alan will still get credit for leading the most laps. Therefore, they told Alan to back off, give Bill the race, conserve fuel, and we will win us a championship. Exactly right. Just what we said a few minutes ago. If Bill leads the rest of the way, Allen will have led the most by one single circuit. Two more laps. Two more laps for Kowicki. Eddie Hamilton has just run out of gas, and Richard Petty coming out of the garage area. Here comes Richard in the SDP Pontiac. He has the car running again with just two more laps to go, but he will be on the racetrack when the checkered flag drops. He was involved in a spectacular accident early in the race and saw the car break an oil uh, cooler up front, caused some, some uh, white flag is out, causing some fire, but Richard is back out on the racetrack. The white flag is out. Now Alan Kowicki comes down and gets it. There is less than one lap to go around this one and a half mile oval at Atlanta Motor Speedway. We are not following the winner the leader of the race, we are focused in on Alan Kowicki, who is going to win the 1992 NASCAR Winston Cup and the $1 million bonus that goes with it. Bill Elliott comes off the fourth corner. He wins the Hooters 500. But Alan Kowicki is coming off of corner number four, knowing that he's winning the championship. There's the checkered flag for Alan. He's the champion for 92. Elliott would go on to lead the final 13 laps and win his fifth race of the season. However, Alan Kowicki is your 1992 NASCAR Winston Cup champion. The crew celebrating their Winston Cup victory in 1992. Allen becomes the 21st NASCAR Winston Cup champion. It comes in his seventh full year of Winston Cup competition but our hats off also to Bill Elliott, who did everything he could possibly do to gain the, gain the championship, but he came up short. And Richard Petty is taking one final lap around this racetrack as the fans salute him, and his career comes to an end. Here comes Kawicki down the front straightaway. He and Richard will probably collide because I'm sure Kawicki's going to do something spectacular. Let's see. Remember his first win at Phoenix? He took what he called, and there these are is. his words, a Polish victory lap. Yep. And guess what? <laughs> He's going to do it again. I think we're about ready. Here he comes. And let's listen. time an owner driver won the NASCAR Winston Cup championship was Richard Petty in 79 and how appropriate on the day he retires Alan Kowicki becomes the first since then to win the title as driver and owner. Here's Jerry. Had Bob there were those that questioned his sanity two years ago when he turned down the likes of Junior Johnson and Bud Moore and Rick Hendrick to do it yourself and Alan today it had to be all worthwhile. Congratulations. I'll tell you man this is like living a dream here. The car ran great. Our engine was fantastic all day and car handled real well in the Goodyear tires. This is the fastest we've ever run at this track and the longest the tires have ever lasted. The Goodyear radials work great. I got to thank my sponsors, Hooters Restaurant, Naturally Fresh Salad Dressings, Classic Mixers, and Ford Motor Company. This Ford Thunderbird's been a great car for us all year long. We ran great. I led the most laps. I knew how far I had to go in a race to lead the most laps. And at that point, you know, there was no way that he could beat me. I was a little bit safe coming down pit road. And we lost first gear in the transmission on our first pit stop. 
So I had trouble getting out of the pits all day long. You know, I think that's probably where he made up a little bit of time on me was, you know, getting in and out of the pits because we were having transmission trouble. But at that point, I knew where we were. You know, I wanted to win the race because we were, you know, we had led quite a while, but there'll be other races, but this championship's what I wanted. And I just, you know, thank God for the fortune to, to be here and to be an American, compete on the Winston Cup circuit, man, when I moved down south years ago. This was my dream. I came in a pickup truck and a trailer, and I want to thank all the people that along the way in ASA and everywhere in my career have helped me. And, uh, you know, I said that we, you know, we made this nickname, this car, the Underbird today. We're going into this race, the underdog, and we ran good. I'm really proud of the whole team. Uh, Paul Andrews, Danny Glad, Ron Vaccaro, Randy Clary, the guys in the engine shop did great. Um, there's more Gary Preziosi and Shane Parsnow, Tony Gibson, Pete Jackson, Jeff Bice, Tom Mount, on and, you know, if I forgot anybody, I'm sorry, but it was a team effort. We got a great team, and I'm really proud of them. I couldn't have done it without them. It's, you know, I said, this is a long answer to one question. <laughs> Cut me off whenever you're here. <laughs> That's fine, Alan. I know you're going to catch your breath. Let us just congratulate you again on becoming the 1992 Winston Cup champion. Congratulations. Thank you. I mean, this is... Uh, just a storybook ending, having Hooter sponsor the race, and my dad's here, and uh, just, just really wonderful. Alan Kowicki, how appropriate here in his seventh year of driving in Winston Cup that he would drive car number seven to the Winston Cup Championship, the last one to win as a car owner and a driver. Who else but King Richard Petty? Yeah. <laughs> Richard, it's been a wonderful four decades, and it's over. Uh, yeah, that's what I been, found out when I made that last lap. Uh, so it's been it's been wonderful. I mean, 35 years, the good Lord's looked after us all these years. And, and yeah, I'm still walking around. Uh, you know, I hate to got in a wreck and disappointed me and some of the fans. But uh, the big deal is we're here talking to you when it's over with. And uh, I, I wouldn't change none of it. I wouldn't trade nothing for nothing else. Neither would we. Thank you so much, Richard, for all the memories. Richard Petty walks out for the final time of the STP Pontiac. Okay, Bill Elliott, you did just about everything you could. You won the race, but as you said when you climbed out of the car, hey, I won, but I lost. Well, it's been a long year, and, you know, regardless of what happens, it's been one of those type seasons, and a lot of things has happened, and, I mean, I'm just glad it's over with. This Budweiser Amico team has done a fantastic job all year long. And to go out, win in the race, the last race Richard Petty will ever run in, I guess that says something. You know, we've done about everything else. We didn't win a championship. And I think we're going to go up to Bill Elliott Ford tomorrow. We're going to have a hell of a car sale. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll see you there. Bill Elliott and Victory Lane, guys. Season is over, and uh, it's been a great one there. You can see uh, Alan Kowicki as he is now on the back of a convertible being paraded in front of the race fans who have gathered here. Alan Kowicki, winner of the 1992 NASCAR Winston Cup Championship. And he's not going backwards. He's going around the racetrack the way he's supposed to. So Elliott won the big three battle of the day for the 13th time, lost the war. Kowicki finished second, and Allison 27th. In the final point standings, Kowicki finishes 10 ahead of Elliott and 63 over Allison. Remember that one lap Kowicki led over Elliott early in the race? How huge was that? Well, it allowed Kowicki to lead the most laps by just one over Elliott. Had Elliott been able to lead that lap and the race played out as it did, Elliott would have led the most laps, giving him the five bonus points, taking those five bonus points away from Kowicki, the two drivers would have been tied in points, and the tiebreaker, most wins, being Elliott's five wins versus Kowicki's two wins, Elliott would have been the 1992 champion. Let's take a look at the final stats and how the preseason favorites did. The main contenders, Dale Earnhardt, your defending champion, finishes a disappointing 12th. Davey Allison finishes third. How about the question mark drivers? Rusty Wallace finishes 13th, also a bit of a disappointment. Mark Martin finishes sixth, and Bill Elliott finishes second. How about the outside looking in drivers? Ricky Rudd finishes seventh, Darrell Waltrip ninth, and Harry Gant fourth. How about the no chance drivers? Well, that was Alan Kowicki, and he won the championship. Elliott and Allison tied for the most wins at five, and Ford wins his first manufacturer's championship 
since 1969 with a dominating 16 wins during the season. A deep dive into the Big Three stats, Elliott and Allison had more wins than Kawiki with five apiece. Allison had the most top fives with 15. All three drivers had 17 top tens. Kawiki had more poles. Allison led more laps. But the telling stat, average finish. 10.6 for Kawiki, 10.9 for Elliott, and 11.5 for Allison. Season surprises, well, besides Alvin Kawiki winning the championship, I'd say Kyle Petty with a fifth place finish in points, and Dale Earnhardt finishing 12th. It was announced before the final race that longtime crew chief Kirk Shomodine will be retiring following this season. And that will do it for the 1992 NASCAR Winston Cup season review. I will see you in the next video.